Kills me, makes me feel alive. Makes me feel alive. can drink any man under the table you say i should have a warning label but you like it yeah you like it when i lose my key i lose my mind but you just laugh and roll your eyes cause you like it yeah you like it i'm not perfect you don't care i ain't sorry you ain't scared cause you got to
Just a couple drops left of summer. Pretty soon we'll be waiting on another one more chance to hold each other one more time. The sun's sinking low, kind of view. The kind of one best made for two. JBL's just setting the mood, waiting on a love from you. When we'll go hot side, riding on that moonlight. Clothes hanging off of no swimming sign. Your lips taste like 19 crimes in half full Dixie cups. In that four door, four bed beach motel. Seven in heaven, no kiss in town. When tomorrow shows up and we see the light, we'll wish we had one more last night. Take tonight, bottle it up, save it for tomorrow, call you up. I'd break out two Dixie cups and grab the good stuff. Hot tide riding on that moonlight, clothes hanging off and no swim inside. Your lips tasting like 19 crimes in half full of Dixie cups. In that four door, four bed beach motel, seven in heaven, no kiss in town. When tomorrow shows up and we see the light. She said, I think I'm losing my head now To now will my bad memories One more drink, she said We know there's no turning back now We love to make bad memories One more drink, she said I think I'm losing my head now To now we make bad memories One more drink, she said We know there's no turning back now We love to make bad memories she said, I think I'm losing my head now, so now we'll make bad memories. One more drink, she said, I think I'm losing my head now. Please take your seats. Our program will begin in 10 minutes. Bad memories. One more drink, he said. And baby, you got me tripping. We're face to face. About to do it again. Again, again, again. About to do it again. Again, again and again. One more drink, he said.
Please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes. Please take your seats. The program is about to begin. If I was stranded on an island, only way I could survive is if I had you and that needle dropping on a vinyl. Please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Doing the same thing, trying to drown you out. Another whiskey drink, but it ain't working because my heart's still broke. My moving on's moving on too slow. You're like a hurricane rattling my brain, running like a freight train all day. Thinking about who you with, where you at, what you wearing now. We're careful.
Time to spare, but I'm in time for you to show how much I care. Wish that I would let you break my walls, but I'm still spinning out of control from the fall. Are you good? Good love. Please take your seats. Our program will begin now. It's been a summer of discontent for the global economy. Inflation is at a 40-year high in the United States and showing few signs of cooling. After initially calling it transitory, the Fed is now vowing to keep at its battle to bring down inflation. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by three quarters of a percentage point. But the measures don't come without collateral damage. Everyone thinks the, the, the Fed can handle this. That hurricane is right out there down the road coming our way. With talk of recession looming, volatility continues to grip financial markets. Some say a hard landing now seems inevitable. So what phase of the downturn are we in? Where does one put money to work? We asked the biggest names across finance and economics how the current environment is impacting asset management, venture capital, crypto, private equity, real estate, and more. This is Bloomberg Invest. Please welcome to the stage Bloomberg Editor-at-Large, Eric Schatzker. Good morning, everybody. To those of you here in person at our world headquarters in New York, and to those of you joining us virtually from around the world, welcome. This is Bloomberg Invest. We are truly delighted to have you. I'm sure you'll agree that this is the perfect time, maybe even a necessary time, to engage the most influential, dynamic, and innovative figures in finance and investing. Why? We have a little bit of an inflation problem. Central banks are jacking up interest rates because of war and geopolitical tensions. Trade has bogged down. Even President Biden, only four weeks away from the midterms, had to admit that a recession is possible. Some of you might say inevitable. Over the next two days, we're going to confront all of this uncertainty and take a hard look at the economy and at markets and explore the challenges and one would hope the opportunities that they present. Before we get started, I have, as is customary, a few announcements. First, I'd like to acknowledge our US presenting sponsors, Crypto.com, Grayscale, Invesco QQQ, and our presenting sponsor, VinFast. 
If folks, you're tuning in virtually and you have any issues with audio or video, try refreshing your browser. You're accustomed to this by now. If that doesn't work, use the chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and somebody will be there to assist you. Uh, we'd also like to say thanks to Thyssen. This is an audio to text platform because thanks to Thyssen, all discussions at Bloomberg Invest are being transcribed in real time and you'll find Thyssen in the transcriptions that I'm referring to at the corresponding session link on the virtual platform. And for those of you here today who need Wi-Fi, you'll find the information on your badge. Uh, whether you're in person or whether you're with us virtually, we want to hear from you. We want you to participate. We'll be conducting live polling and soliciting questions from the audience all day long. Here's what I need you to do right now. Scan the QR code on the screen or type the following. Meet.ps forward slash Bloomberg invest into your browser. If you need that link again, don't worry, we'll be putting it up all day long. There is no time like the present to test this platform. And so I'd like all of you to join me in our first poll of the day. Once you've scanned this QR code, it's right there on the screen, right there on your virtual screen, or typed in meet.ps forward slash Bloomberg invest, click the polling icon at the bottom right hand corner of your screens. And if, you know, you'll see that you can toggle back and forth between Q&A and polling via these icons at the bottom of the screen. And without further ado, here is our first poll of the day. The question is, how soon will the US enter a recession? And your options, as you can see them here, are one, by the end of 2022, two, the first quarter of 2023, three, we're already in a recession, four, a recession can still be averted. So place your votes now and I will reveal the results momentarily. We also want to hear from all of you on social media. Use hashtag Bloomberg Invest. That's pretty simple. And if you like, keep up with us by following at Bloomberg Live on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on Instagram. Or if you're fortunate enough to have a Bloomberg terminal, look for Bloomberg Invest on the Live Go function. Now, if we have those polling results, let's take a look at them. Oh, interesting dispersion. OK, well, uh, a vast majority of you <laughs> think we're either in a recession or will soon enter one. Um, and almost nobody thinks that we can escape without a recession. I don't find that surprising. I don't know if you do. Um, I'd like to thank you right now for your patience and get started with our program. The past few days, we're nothing short of historic at the world's largest hedge fund. Ray Dalio, the iconic Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates, handed over control of the firm he built over the past 47 years. It's nothing short of a generational shift. Ray is 73, as many of you know. His successors at Bridgewater are younger, and they've got their own ideas. And we're delighted one of those leaders is here today at Bloomberg Invest. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Nir Bardea, Bridgewater co-CEO. Good morning, Nir. Good morning. It's great to be here. Nine and a half months ago, on January the 3rd, Bridgewater named you co-CEO. You, a mystery man. Somebody almost no one outside the firm had ever heard of. And here you are today, still pretty much an unknown quantity, so I think we should begin by having you tell us your story. Who is Nir Bardea, and what's he all about? I love the mystery. Um... But yeah, first of all, there was a principle there of, uh, of doing before I speak. Um, so it was a desire to get in the role and actually, um, and actually do things. Um, and then I think to get to know me, I know for a lot of people, I'm not necessarily what they would be expecting. I don't sound like it. I might not look like it for the role um, of the CEO of Bridgewater. And I think to understand that, 
uh, you have to understand where I come from because it is different. I come from the other side of the world um, with grandparents that came from Libya and Poland and Hungary, uh, some of them escaping the Second world, world War, losing their families in the Holocaust. And really fugitives with their backs to the wall came to what is now Israel. And the reason that's so important because my, the arc of my life, my, my raising, is so intertwined with that story. My first memories are sitting uh, in my grandparents' bakery. This is this Libyan guy named Shimon and this Polish woman named Rachel who married in this extremely unlikely marriage and started a bakery. I, I, still, I can still smell the bread and the cookies. And seeing that generation of people literally build a country around me. I, my earliest memories are of dirt roads and then an industrialized city of Tel Aviv. And then for any of you that know Israel today, it's this innovative, developed country. And that lesson, Eric, of what people, the right people, when they come together and they share culture and values can accomplish really unbelievable things, uh, underlies everything about my life. So I'll fast forward. And eight years ago, when I get to Bridgewater and I'm thinking about um, whether I'm going to stay here in the United States, I have that memory of reflecting back and saying, I found something I've been looking for for a long time, which is an amazing group of people at Bridgewater uh, that share a deep culture and common values and, uh, and are on this audacious mission to understand how the world works. You have what I would call an uncommon background for a hedge fund executive, let alone a chief executive. You're a former officer and platoon leader in the Israeli military mm -hmm. who, I should add, founded a drone startup, worked in real estate, served as an advisor and speechwriter to Israel's UN mission. Not common. How did you land at Bridgewater, and what was your trajectory from eight years ago to the C-suite? You describe the path pretty well. And again, I can take you through those three components that I've mentioned. Any one of those stops, whether it's in the military, in the Israeli mission to the United Nations, in the startup, it was always about getting together a group of people that had such deep common grounds and wanted to do something that excited me. I can go through any of those pieces, and I think the diversity of those experiences makes the complexion of who I am today. And then the landing at Bridgewater was much more around finding those values than being attracted necessarily to asset management at that point. It was finding a home, a place where I could be myself. Uh, like, how did you stop? I mean, pe people have heard of Bridgewater, but it's not the kind of thing that you necessarily would have come in contact with. Did somebody recruit you? Did you respond to a job ad? Funny story. So uh, no, uh, Karen Carniol Tambour, who's one of the most talented uh, people we have uh, at Bridgewater, she's the CEO of our sustainability fund, and uh, reached out to me. And she's like, I've heard about you in the Israeli circle. She's also Israeli. And, uh, and why did you come talk to us? And I came and I interviewed at Bridgewater eight or nine times. Uh, and it was that process of getting to know each other uh, at the deep levels that I just described. And just the other half of your question of, because I get this question also of, you know, you're 41 and you're the CEO of Bridgewater, and how did that happen? Like, how did that happen? And I think for a lot of us that had successes and failures in life, we know it's a combination of the opportunities that we either create for ourselves or we're lucky enough to stumble upon, and then what we do with those opportunities. And I was very lucky to cross paths with Bridgewater when Bridgewater was facing one of its most important challenges in decades. So back in 2015, when I come to Bridgewater, Bridgewater starts the journey of transitioning. And when I land in the investment engine at Bridgewater on the ground level with our equities team, it's the beginning of thinking about how we're going to transition our investment oversight from Ray Dalio to the next generation. I just want to stop you for a moment because Anyone outside the firm probably doesn't know what the investment engine is. If I'm not mistaken, it's the combination of research, portfolio construction, trading across correct. asset classes, correct? Good job. It's the hub. It's the brain. It's where, it's where it gets done. Uh, it's where we create insights about how the world works and then translate in those insights into portfolios that serve our clients. Nir, I referred to this earlier. A generational shift is underway at Bridgewater. It took 12 years, actually, of trying, but Ray has finally let go, right? Giving up control of the firm. Why is that so important? 
So I think it's so important, and I want to comment on the 12 years also, but it's, uh, it's so important because that's the future of the company. That's the, the, so many organizations fail to move from this founder stage, especially when you have such an iconic founder like Ray, and, and actually create a sustainable uh, institution. So it's everything. I mean, when you think about this mission, when you think about we're 47 years into Bridgewater now, when you think about the next 50 years or the next 100 years and, uh, and keep evolving this amazing organization and serving our amazing clients well, making it through this transition meant everything about the future. Ray's 73. Uh, and, and forget about just Ray being 73. Where are the next ideas going to come from? The hunger, the innovation. Um, we had, this was a must-win battle for us. And when you look around, people talk about 12 years, and I'm like, yeah, it's a long time, but it's also a very hard thing to do. And I think if any of you know our industry, it's much easier to recall failed attempts than successful attempts. Ray himself has described the transition as very challenging. Um, you just said it's not easy to do. Help us understand why. Why is it so difficult? Basically, everything has to get rewired. Everything has to get rewired in an organization. Think about the, the fundamentals I've talked earlier about, what draws people to work together, what defines the culture and how they interact, what defines the goals that you're going to pursue. When you're in a founder-led organization, all those things, they come out of the founder. And when you take that, it's like taking the brain and the heart out of a human and implanting a brain and a new heart. And just think about how complicated that is. And that's why that process was very gradual, time-tested. We started in 2017 with management changes. In 2020, this is where I, this is kind of, this was my, the peak of my career ahead of, uh, ahead of becoming CEO. We've transitioned the investment oversight of Bridgewater two years ago from Ray Dalio, this investment committee led by Bob Prince, Greg Jensen, and, uh, and a, a group of very talented asset class leaders. But just think about it. In this industry, two years ago, changing the people that make investment decisions at Bridgewater and then having two years of outstanding performance for our clients, that is an incredibly difficult thing to do that we're very proud of. And that led us a week ago to say, okay, we're ready to transition control and move the control of the board from, uh, from Ray to the next generation. What's Ray's role now? Ray, so to any of you who know Ray, I know you know Ray well, Ray is both an investor, active investor, thinks about markets and, and invests his own money and, and shares his ideas. So he's, he's an idea generator does not sit on an investment committee at all. Um, he's a board member, and he's a mentor to me and, and to others at Bridgewater. How will the, uh, the boardroom dynamics be different now that Ray no longer has the final word? So I, I'd say it's an interesting question, because at Bridgewater, we've, we strive to have a meritocracy, not just at the board, but everywhere. I mean, Ray's lead. famous idea meritocracy. It's not Ray's famous ideas meritocracy. It's He's Bridgewater's. It <laughs> it's, yeah, it's Bridgewater's. I mean, when, when we think about understanding how the world works, we think that person in the back row over there might have the best idea. And if we don't give that person a voice and, 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 and weigh his ideas based on their merit, we might not get to truth and understand how things work. So the same dynamic we've always aspired to have in the boardroom. But in reality, when there are dynamics and rules and and, and decisions are being made in a certain way that can influence how the conversation happens in the board meeting. So the biggest change I think that happens with this, uh, with this transition is that we have an even better meritocracy in the boardroom. Um, I, mean, I, have raise, to, I have to raise imagine one voice that, out of many. And there surely were times when this happened, he could just silence debate by saying, like, I've had enough. This is the way I want it to be. Never happened, though. Really? Not once. Never happened. I, I'm not. I, I want to be honest about. It. it doesn't have to happen to still know who can make the decision in the room. Uh, sure. You know, sometimes your parents are kind of like. It feels like a debate, but you know, you can't win the argument in the end. But, uh, but, uh, but Ray never did that. Ray really, truly aspired to never veto, never overrule the rest of the board. Um, so it never happened. Would this have happened sooner? or later, maybe, had uh, David, your predecessor as CDO, David McCormick, uh, not left to pursue um, a seat in the US Senate? I appreciate that question. Um, so 12-year journey has a lot of heroes in it. Uh, very big undertaking, 
and and you see Ray's face, and I'm sitting with you all here today, and it's easy kind of to take the headline faces, but there are many heroes along this way. Uh, some still work at Bridgewater, some have left, and Dave is definitely one of those heroes that took the baton and ran a really important piece of the relay. Um, so I think this happened right on time. He passed the baton to me, positioning me to get to the finish line. Um, so I think it would have happened. I think it happened at the right time, but Dave played a really important role in getting us there, and also a really important role in my mentorship and development. What changes? I wonder now that people in their 30s and 40s, right? People like you, people like Greg Jensen, whom you mentioned, the co-chief investment officer, are running Bridgewater. How are things going to be different now that you have a new heart and a new brain? So. I'll touch on what I think needs to stay the same and what is different. So the things that need to stay the same, the bedrock, remember I said in the beginning, it's the best group of people that I know. They got together and share these values of seeking improvement, learning, excellence. This is our culture, the, the people that I'm sure read about it. Uh, and then pursuing audacious goals, that basic bedrock stays the same. But the ideas are different. The ideas are different. What we're going to pursue is different. How we're going to evolve that culture is different. Those things of how we go about those fundamentals are different. The hunger is different. The energy is different. Um, and we can get into examples of what that's like. Well, and I want to. You've described, to me anyway, one of your priorities as re-underwriting the firm's culture. What do you mean by re-underwriting? So great. Uh, so if, if we just go to what the firm's culture is, uh, I said it quickly. Let me say it slower. I mean, and let's be clear: the firm's culture has something of a reputation. Yeah, um, I understand, and I, and some of it is uh, is misunderstood, uh, and some of it is not for everyone. It's just not for everyone, and that's okay. But this idea of a group of people who are, and I'm serious about this, who are saying we care so much about being great that we're not going to let things stand in a way of understanding what's actually true. Because once you know what's true, you know what the problems are, you know where you need to, to improve. That core idea stays the same. That culture, how to do this, has evolved every year since its inception, including when Ray was in charge. But now the responsibility of who's going to evolve it, what tools are you going to use, what standards, what principles are you going to put in play, that responsibility moves to a different group of people. And that's what I mean by re-underwriting it. OK, so how does that happen practically? How does the culture need to adapt, to evolve, to change, to appeal to a younger generation in, what I should add, is an unbelievably competitive market for investing talent? So I'll give examples. I think mm -hmm. examples make this the most tangible. Um, and. Um, and again, when I say that it, it's not for everyone, it's a real thing. It's not for everyone. Uh, some people come, they see it. We're not trying to market something that everybody's going to love. We have high attrition in early years. But once Bridgewater clicks for you, 25% of our people have been around for over a decade, and 50% and of our people have been around for over five years. But I'll give you an example. One of the things that we learned that we need to change is in this directness of let me tell you the truth and what I think and all these things, if you're thinking about a meritocracy and you want that person in the back row to speak, that level of assertiveness, that level of extroversion, that level of directness might mute that person. But you need, that might be the smartest person in the room. How do you change that dynamic and still create that directness with making sure they're not on their back feet and being able to express their ideas? That's a, a good example of an evolution we're really focused on this year, that inclusion. How do you do it? Bridgewater's famous for tools. Do you have new tools? Yeah, so we evolve, all, we evolve our tools, as an example. We're actually next week rolling out, we have this dot system. This dot system allows every person now in the room to kind of put their thoughts about what others are doing in real time. We changed it. We changed their criteria. We changed what the feedback is like and what it sounds like. And we put out new principles. So as an example of the thing that I just said, one of the principles that we've created is how people should engage with their thoughts. And this is going to sound like a subtle difference, but when I'm saying something to you, am I, am I saying that to you because I need to convince you that I'm right, or am I saying that to you as a question because I want to understand what's right? One year from now, two years from now, five years from now, will we think of Bridgewater as being, quote unquote, more normal? Is that one of your goals? No. No, not at all. I, Bridgewater, I think Bridgewater is outstanding today, and I hope Bridgewater will remain outstanding in the ways that it is today. 
I think being, I think it's crazy to be normal in that way. <laughs> Will we come to think of its culture as a little more normal? Again, I, anybody that looks at the world sees different pockets of people come together around different sets of values. I actually think that level of distinctiveness at Bridgewater creates that unity that then allows us to go and pursue audacious goals, like I said before. Do you and Greg believe as passionately in radical truthfulness and radical transparency? And Bob Prince, absolutely. And Karen Carniel Tambor. The most important thing that brings people together around, around at Bridgewater is the belief in those values. Greg has talked about needing to take bigger risks on talent and on technology. What specifically do you and he have in mind? So I think generally when uh, I'm going to, I'll talk about talent and I'll talk about technology mm -hmm. and I'll talk about risk in general. I think with the new, with, with the new blood, the new brain, the new heart, there's a hunger. There's a risk appetite. There are ideas. We talked about this. So in talent, I think just our, our open-mindedness, our desire to move from this founder-led organization to a team-based organization puts a lot more emphasis on finding great players. Um, and empowering them? And empowering them and creating the space for them. Um, so that's a big part of what, what we're doing now and we've been doing over the last uh, several, several years. And on technology, anybody who's in our industry who's trying to seek alpha or, again, this mission of understanding how the world works uh, knows that in order to do that, you have to be on the cutting edge of technology. The ability to ingest the amounts of data that are available in the world today. Do analysis on that data to create insights and then take that insight and construct portfolios with this. You can't do that unless you're on the cutting edge of technology and that takes investments and innovation. We've been doing that for decades and we plan to stay on the cutting edge of that. You help to build the investment engine, but you're not really part of the investment process, right? Right. Is that weird as the co-CEO of a $150 billion asset management company? I think it makes perfect sense, meaning I, I feel privileged that I have spent all the entire last decade, nearly a decade, in the investment engine, so deeply immersed with our investment teams, managing the investment teams, being a part of the investment process. People need to know what they do best. I'm not the best investor you're going to find, but I designed the investors really well do their jobs well, and I set the strategic priorities and the culture and the people, and it takes a partnership like that between me and Mark Berlini, who's my partner, along with Greg Jensen and Bob Prince and Karen and others to create that synergy of one plus one equals a lot more than three. So in addition to talent and technology, which are clearly priorities, what are some of your other priorities as co-CEO? So, let me answer that at two levels. I'll give you the interesting answer, but I'm going to keep hammering the point that I, that I want people to understand about us. So more than anything in this transition from founder to us, if you look in five years and you're saying they still have the best people in the world coming to work at Bridgewater, we nailed it. They're still operating in this uncom uncompromising way to seek excellence and learning and truth. We nailed it. And they're still going after audacious goals to help them understand how the world works. We nailed it. And then underneath that, you can expect four things from us. One, we've been on this journey to marry our top-down macro understanding to a bottoms-up understanding, which is more and more feasible because of how technology has been evolving. And that gives us a lot of opportunities in the equity space and in the credit space. You can expect us to keep mining in that direction in serious ways. Second is we've been involved in China and uh, and and have been leaders in understanding China. And you can expect us, given how big of a deal that is, to keep leading on that front. Sustainability has been a big deal. We can get into why. And then the last thing is the technology that surrounds all these things, as I've touched on before. Those are four threads that if you look at our goals over the next five years, you should be able to measure us against each one of those four. A couple of quick questions then. Say a little bit more about sustainability. It's becoming, rightly or wrongly, a controversial topic. So I'll put the controversy aside because it's not, we're not taking a view on any of these things. We're not taking a view on, on sustainability or on China. I'll, I'll take both of those examples together. If we're entering a space, it's happening for one of two reasons or both of these reasons. It either matters a lot for somebody trying to understand how the world works. So there are 30 to $40 trillion of assets that are now taking sustainability into consideration and how, and how they're managed. China is 20% of the world's 
GDP, a smaller part of the markets, but those are big deals for an investor trying to understand how the world works. So that's one motivation. Is it a big deal? You got to understand it. The second thing is we have these amazing clients, and they have their goals and priorities about how they want to manage their portfolios. And a growing number of them are saying to us, this matters to me. Either we want exposure to China, or we want to invest 3D investing in, uh, and, and invest in, in, through sustainable lens. One of those two reasons, or both of them, are the reasons why I put those two things on our list. You mentioned equities. You mentioned credit. I might throw private markets into that. Should we, are those areas that Bridgewater is going to go into as an investor, or is it simply just a matter of understanding those markets better so that you can be a better macro investor? So I'd say that's an open question uh, in the sense of we're definitely, we're already in equities, we're already deeply in equities. And as I said, equities and credit in a more bottoms up way uh, is, some, is a journey we've been on. And you can expect us to keep mining that direction. Uh, but I would say even things like private assets, uh, it's not that it's within our plans now, but it's certainly been a growing force that matters to any investors and our ability to understand that. And if at any point we would have thought, hey, you know what, to create the best portfolios for our clients, we should get into that space, that we would have done it. It just wasn't the thing that we needed to do. Near your clients have a very simple way of measuring, of defining first and then measuring success returns. Mm -hmm. And this year, Bridgewater's returns, at least in the pure alpha strategy, are good. How do you define and measure success? So first of all, yes, we've had, I'd say since that change that we've done in the summer of 2020, moving to the investment committee, we've had, uh, we've delivered really well results, really great results for our clients. But I would, I would just come back to the point that I made about my grandparents in the beginning of the conversation. Our success and the ability to create returns for our clients through the years is just going to be measured by having the great people come work at Bridgewater, having them operate in the culture that we've discussed, and keep thinking critically about the most audacious goals for us to pursue together. Nir, thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Nir Bardea, the co-CEO of Bridgewater. Please welcome to the stage Apollo partner and deputy chief investment officer of credit, John Zito with Bloomberg Shanali Bassett. I think I said the wrong Okay. I'd like to think they chose the good music for us, John. Yes, <laughs> but, you know, all kidding aside, John is overseeing a portfolio here that's more than, or nearly $400 billion of Apollo's, about $500 billion un under management. So, really, Apollo is a massive credit manager for a firm that's widely known as a buyout firm. So, this should be the moment, right? <laughs> but there's so much confusion out there, John, about how to invest in credit in markets that are fluctuating so rapidly. Where do you see the opportunities right now, and are you diving in at a greater rate than you were perhaps yesterday? Yeah, well, thanks, Sonali, and thanks, Bloomberg, for having us. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're pinching ourselves a little bit that, you know, where yields are today, you know, globally. We've, we've been building our, our credit business for the last 20 years, and effectively a majority of that time we built it with, with rates at zero. Um, so we built our retirement services business, which is effectively uh, a spread business. Um, and most of our businesses as we've grown have really been built on the assumption that rates were going to be zero forever. Um, and most of the people, you know, half of our employee base have never seen interest rates anywhere near where they are today. And I know historically they're not even that high. Um, so, you know, for my, the beginning of my career, you actually could make money and credit from actually generating income. Income was a strategy carry was a strategy. Uh, for the last 15 years, you had to effectively manufacture returns. You had to manufacture returns through origination. You had to manufacture returns through buying something at 98 and hoping it got refinanced at, at 102. Um, and it was really a tough environment to generate returns. And um, I think we're all looking around saying, wow, you know, right now we can get, you know, what was Six and a half percent on the triple C index a year ago is now the yield on the investment grade index. And you can buy companies that have hundreds of billion of market cap below you, um, and you can buy the bonds at 50, 60, 70 cents on the dollar. It's the, you know, it's it's pretty amazing environment. And obviously not to discount that there's lots of risks in the world, um, but 
you know, if you're not excited about investing in credit with dollar prices effectively at the, the lows um, since the GFC, three points from the lows in GFC, you know, loan yields, any floating rate debt, because of where the base rate is and where the risk-free rate is, you can generate 11, 12, 13% rates of return for the top part of the capital structure, for the senior parts of the capital structure. You know, it's not, it's something is wrong, right? Equity, you can't really have a cost of capital at the top part of the capital structure that's double digit rate of return and equities having a multiple that's not all that different from just a handful of years ago. Yeah, you had mentioned you don't want to discount all the problems in the world right now. You said 60, 70 cents on the dollar for safe debt is all well and good if things don't get worse from here. How do you kind of factor in the risk of things getting worse from here, even for safer companies? Yeah. Again, so, so duration just generally as an asset class has been something people have been trying to avoid for 15 years, right? And the 60-40 portfolio, which is having its worst year in a long time, um, historically duration was a hedge on things getting a lot worse. Um, and right now the, over, the overwhelming assumption is that higher rates are effectively going to leave the market down. You know, by and large, I would say, I think 80 to 120% of the forward rate curve and forward rates market, you know, 2022 is really about monetary policy for risk markets. It's been, our rates going to be higher? You had some geopolitical events around it, but effectively the pacing of the rate hikes, the speed, unprecedented when you combine that with, with the uh, quantitative tightening that's been going on. Um, it's pretty, it's frankly, if you, th if you told me a year ago that we would raise rates to where we have at the pace that we have and slowed and had QT at the same time, I, I would have said more things would have broken. Um, you know, you're starting to see a couple things break, um, but, but, you know, it's been, it's been very fast. I think the, the next 23 is really going to be about what has been the impact of these rate hikes. You know, it takes about 12 months to actually see it flow through. Yeah, your colleague had told me just yesterday that distressed opportunities you're not really going to see for 12 to 15 months. Apollo has been known to be one of the biggest distress managers in the world. So how do you gauge that opportunity? And is that not the golden opportunity for you guys anymore? Is it something else? Yeah, so dis distressed historically, it was very complex. Uh, you would buy things relative to their public markets at a steep discount. And, you know, we have a, a close to 40-year track record of investing in this, 40, 42 years track record of investing in distressed and doing it, um, doing it well, 32-year track record of doing it well. Um, you know, it's, there's, it's, the distressed market has gotten very institutionalized. Um, if rates are going to be here, you effectively have to want to own equities um, if you're going to invest in distressed. And when you can generate double digit rates of return for senior parts of the capital structure, that's typically when you invest going into an economic cycle, you should start with that. Start with the easy stuff. Start with investing senior. Um, start with investing at the top part of the capital structure, especially if you can generate you know, equity, equity like returns. And no one knows how bad or what the path is going to be. Um, with certainty. Well, you mentioned also that some things might look like they're starting to break. Where are things starting to look a little bit troubled? And what else are you worried about? Yeah, a lot, a lot of it's been macro related. It hasn't been um, on the economy. And that's been, I think, the hard part for just people to, to, to set a framework for how to invest over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, you know, clearly, the things going on with LDI and in the UK, um, clearly, when you have G7 rates markets moving 100, 150 basis points. Um, that's that's pretty severe. Um, when you have currencies moving 40, 50 percent, when you have central banks in in Japan moving them to to effectively stabilize the currency. Um, typically, when you have these types of moves, you've had rate multiple standard deviation moves in rates, multiple standard deviation moves in commodities, multiple standard deviation moves in currencies. Usually things, you know, there's someone exposed on the wrong side of that. Um, and that creates pockets of opportunity when people start selling safe things, right? So, so last week, um, you saw, saw we, we were actively engaged in purchasing very safe assets um, from, from effectively for sellers. Um, for on behalf of our insurance balance sheet. Yeah, let's get definitely more specific about that. I think what you're talking about here is that purchasing of CLOs 
from the pension funds that were kind of burned in this LDI crisis here in, in the UK. Um, from what I understand, that was a very sizable investment. So what are we talking about in terms of how much you were able to spend in a short amount of time and how that compares with what you've been doing all year? Yeah, so about a billion five transacted last week. That's 800% more than usual. So it was significantly higher than the normal. That's for amount. the market. For the, for the market, the okay. aggregate market. Yeah, we purchased about a third of the aggregate supply that came to market. $500 million. $500 million. And we invest on behalf of our, effectively on our hold to maturity. And the reason, the way we get comfortable with it is if you look at where investment grade tranches, and this is going to be a bit complex for those that don't know the tranching of CLOs, but effectively think about it as you're generating a 10% rate of return and your break even is that you need cumulative defaults to be 60 to 70% over the next five years. So what's being priced into those securities is that effectively 70% of the market's going to default um, in the next five years in Europe and European issuers, which again is unprecedented and, and extremely unlikely. So dive in a little here. That's an interesting trade you made on a, on a you know, kind of single situation basis. But are there other types of situations like that that are happening, given the stresses you're seeing in the world and that the, the margin calls, frankly, investors are facing and force, uh, forcing them to sell assets? Yeah, I mean, generally the banks, generally the banks are short balance sheet across the globe. Um, some of it's being driven by uh, rate volatility, um, having to post capital on mortgages, um, losses that are, are well documented about some of the leverage finance books. Um, so generally, the banks are kind of out out of of, of excess balance sheet. Um, we're consistently growing our annuity book and our retirement services. We have third party investors that we inv invest on behalf of endowments, foundations, um, several retirement businesses. Um, you know, those everybody's looking for safe yield and. In, in addition to kind of what we've done in the g general QCIP market, we've also acquired and built 25 origination companies that invest on behalf of, you name it, we, we, we finance against an, an aircraft. We finance against a, a, a fleet of cars, against mortgages, uh, commercial real estate buildings. Um, anything that has an asset, in addition to our cash flow lending businesses, we have a very large asset-based business. Historically, that business has been financed by the securitization or bank market. And as the banks pull back, we have all these origination machines that are generating and creating capital to actually allow the economy to continue to function and continue to originate new loans. A lot of that's being done on behalf of our origination machines. And as the banks move out of that and have less balance sheet, we've been able to actually continue to write loans into that market and well, generate excess spread. It's interesting then, because presumably some of the assets that are coming into the market now, again, because of forced selling or other reasons, could be then assets that support the businesses you're trying to build, like that asset-based business, which frankly a lot of your rivals are trying to build at the same time. And so, you know, were those types of assets also coming up, asset-based financing um, and other kind of yeah, structured what, securities? Yeah, what you've seen is an increase, obviously, in, in kind of CLO. Um, you've seen an increase in Anyone who needs new capital today, the cost is up anywhere between 150 and 200 basis points on spread. And so we're just looking across the whole ecosystem and saying, okay, where's the best risk adjusted return for our, for our LPs and for our own balance sheet? Um, and again, right now it's, it's, it's really about most opportunities that are new dollars going into the ground are really interesting. So let's take a huge step back here for a second because another opportunity that I've heard you talk about that's only exacerbating, a lot of your rivals have talked about, is that wall of refinancing in the face of higher interest rates. What does this mean for a lot of corporate America, frankly, companies across the globe, and where you fit in as these maturities come due? Yeah, so we, generally speaking, uh, CFOs have done a great job of pushing out their maturities. 22 has been the lightest year in a long time in, in issuance of new high yield debt. Um, you'll have about 10% of the market come up for refinancing in 23, another 15% in 24, um, and then any sort of new M&A that needs to get done, so any sort of new money. But in aggregate, we expect there to be several hundred billion of new financing needs in the next couple years. Um, some companies are waiting, trying to hope the market gets a bit better. Um, inevitably, they'll be forced to make a decision, and and we've really been large participants in any sort of new second. Over the last 60 days, as the Fed has moved more aggressively, really in the last 60 days, financial conditions have tightened. 
by about 400 basis points in the last 60 to 90 days. Um, access to capital has shrunk, and we've been a large participant in any sort of new financing that's come to market, and it's been documented around, around our participation in Citrix. Um, we were also the largest participant in the Royal Caribbean uh, new secured financing. And I think we'll be, we will be continue to put out new capital on any sort of new secured type investment because, again, we think you're going to generate double digit rates of return. And no matter what you think the probability is of, of outcomes for the economy and the world, um, the likely outcome is if you're the top 10% or 20% of a capital structure, um, the likelihood is you're going to get your money back. Uh, and the likelihood is you're going to make your full return on that investment. But, you know, even beyond the opportunity that you guys have ahead of you, you know, it's like what Scott Minard says, never hire a, an optimistic bond fund manager, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, a lot of that is because, and, and I spend a lot of time in credit, because the equity markets are kind of ignoring that wall of maturity, right? So what does that mean for investors who may not recognize exactly how much more companies are going to have to pay their debt investors moving forward? I agree with, I mean, you know me pretty well, so this is like as positive as I've been on the markets. I mean, it's kind of hard. It's actually an unnatural thing for a, for a bond investor, a credit guy, to actually be excited about the markets. And um, the times that you get excited about the markets are frankly when kind of everybody hates the world. So um, it is, a, it is a, a weird spot to be in. But, um, you know, we, we may be early, a bit early, um, but I have so much confidence in the team and where we are in the capital structure. Um, that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do pretty well, um, I think. But our company is gonna become zombies at a faster rate because they can't afford to pay. Yeah. So again, the if you have an all floating rate capital structure, you probably have too much debt, right? You know, if you had a billion dollars of debt, you had to pay fifty million of interest or sixty million of interest last year. Next year, you're gonna have to pay one hundred and ten million of interest or one hundred million of interest. So, you know, the the psychology for that company um, can shift pretty quickly. It can make it. Um, you know, you go from generating, typically a company will generate, let's say, on a billion dollar debt, 30 to 50 million of free cash flow per year, so 3 to 5 percent of the total debt quantum. If all of a sudden now you're burning cash mm -hmm. and you see the economy slowing, the entire psychology around that, that business changes. So your CapEx spending, your hiring, and then that flows into the whole economy. And that's what's happening right now. For the first half of the year, you didn't really feel the rate hike. It happened in risk markets because the Fed was saying, okay, we're going to raise rates a lot. Mm -hmm. And the forward plot was saying we were going to raise rates, but it didn't flow through to, to actual the cost of financing until these last two rate hikes. The cost of financing, there's a lot of frustration about how fast things have moved and where things were priced. Let's use Citrix as an example because um, you guys eventually got in. <laughs> how much is out there? You know, at the end of the second quarter, the banks globally were hung with billions worth of loans that have been marked down significantly in the leveraged loan market. It's only gotten worse. You have Twitter out there, you had Citrix, you had Nielsen, you had a whole bunch of deals. And I'm wondering, what is your expectation? How long is this overhang on the market going to last for? And realistically, how much can you dive into it in pure dollars? Yeah, so, you know, we, we're, as you mentioned, we're 400 billion. So for us, you know, five, you know, $400 million position is effectively a 1%. Like, so we can we can participate. Um, we'll be on the credits we like. We can be meaningful. Um, we've done as large as, you know, we with SoftBank we we effectively committed to five billion dollars in the beginning of the year, um, and then we've been several transactions, multi billion dollars. So we can be big. Um, it's a function of both the credit quality and the price. I think we're down to about fifty to sixty billion, depending on how you look at some of the term loan A market. But we're we're about fifty to sixty billion. And it's somewhat concentrated. I think most of the marks have started to get taken. I think you'll start to move through that risk. The question is really going to be about how much excess balance sheet are they going to go in. You're seeing lots of volatility with some banks today um, with their core businesses. Um, my suspicion is that you'll probably see the economy slow down and some of the consumer books start to slow a bit. Um, and so lending is getting pulled back pretty aggressively. And so. Um, how are they going to commit on a go-forward basis? Uh, in what way? I think we're going to be partners with them on a lot of those commitments. As we've grown our direct business, we've become great partners with them in terms of their long, tons of origination. They have tons of relationships. Uh, and we're long capital right now. So we're, we're in a pretty unique spot um, with respect to that. So it's about partnering origination, their partnership, their trust that they've built with several issuers, 
you know, our relationship with issuers and our capital. And there's actually a natural partnership there that, that I think is a long time, you know, Bloomberg likes to talk about the banks versus Apollo. Um, <laughs> I actually think that that relationship's getting stronger. Well, it's interesting because 10 years ago, I started here as a banking reporter, and I accidentally became the private equity reporter. And it's because of what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, I'm wondering, that was post-2008, structural changes, and now we're hitting another big roadblock in the economy. And you wonder, how much is that going to accelerate or change the way that private capital takes on more capacity, especially as so many European banks are constrained? Yeah. I, again, so almost every investor that I've met with in the last 10 years has been trying to get out of credit. Rightfully so, right? No one woke up in the morning saying, hey, John, I want to go give you fixed income capital at 0% rate, you know, zero, zero risk-free rate in a 5% high yield market. Who would do that? Um, and so, those discussions generally for just a core credit mandate have been tough. You flash forward to today, I've been on the road the last couple of weeks. Every single global investor is trying to figure out the complete opposite of the last 15 years is how do I get money out of equities, out of private, into credit, into alternatives, into direct. And there is going to be that hole that you're talking about is going to be filled by the global community and it's going to be funded away from equity and into debt. Because when you can get, you can generate unlevered returns at 12, 13, 14% on great companies with great sponsors, it's, it's likely that that's gonna be a big asset allocation pivot, which, which again is a big regime shift for the markets for over the last you know, 14, 15 years. Means something with the cost of leverage going up. You know, last word here, biggest mistake you're seeing in the market right now? Biggest mistake. Um, I think, listen, in credit, I, I'll talk about credits and not so much equities, but, but you know, for us is, is looking and saying, okay, see, because credit managers, as you mentioned, tend to be so, so negatively inclined, they're seeing all, all of the bad, and again, it's likely that the economy is going to slow materially. But when you have dollar prices at significantly low levels, when you have yields at their highest level that you've seen in a long time, you're, the, I, I think people will look back over this vintage, over investing over the next six and 12 months, and realize that, that it was a great environment for, for senior lending and senior credit, and that they probably should have been more aggressive. Because when they turns around and people feel like it's OK, or there's some normalization of monetary policy, or maybe the economy stabilizes at some point or some level that they can get comfortable with, it's very hard to, to go and then buy. Um, and it'll move really quickly. And so um, you know, every day I'm pushing the team to try to find OK, obviously there's risks out there, um, but we need to be putting out money every single day. John, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Aerial Investments Chairman, Co-CEO, and Chief Investment Officer, John Rogers, Jr., with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. Ah, oh, it is still so nice to be in front of a crowd. Thank you all for dedicating your valuable time being here today. Thank you, John, for dedicating your incredibly valuable time as a value investor in this volatile moment with all your years of experience. Please, I want some of you actually not looking at us at all. I want you on your phones. I want you sharing some of the thoughts, the leadership coming from John today. Hashtag Bloomberg Invest. Get involved with us on social media as well. And I'm going to have a little poll for you in a minute to get you involved too. But John, every day is extraordinary. And the beginning of the year, we don't need to go through some of the pain trades, the I mean, trillions lost in global stock markets, the fact that we've had the worst start to the year since some point in the 80s. Are you at the moment within this volatile time, what do you even think value means right now? How do you define it? Well, I'm still defining value the way we always have trying to find stocks that are selling at low multiples, that are selling at significant discounts to private market value, companies that have strong balance sheets and a strong moat around them. So we're not shifting and adjusting. I know a lot of value managers have shifted to buying you know, larger cap growth stocks that have been broken. They think they're cheap. But we really are sticking to our tried and true principles, and the value really hasn't changed. And when everyone's getting afraid of value, that's when we think there's real opportunity there. And sticking to your patient. 
focus and I know that has been with you since of course you started this incredible journey I think at the age of 24 when you first founded the business in 1983 extraordinary to have that focus that drive at that age let's just get the focus and the drive from the audience for a second I want to understand from you whether you still got that patient determination within value stocks do you think value stocks as they're defined are going to outperform growth stocks as they did perhaps at the start of this year but then it's all got a bit hairy do you think over the next six months value will outperform growth get involved in the poll if you can the moment i can see well actually most of you do think that value is going to outperform they're with you john i'm pleased to say um talk to us a little bit therefore as the mood of the room seems to be agreeing with you how you're going to look for those opportunities within this patience when it suddenly feels like things have sold off things are becoming more attractive but you're also looking at the world of bonds. Maybe treasuries are suddenly giving some sort of an alternative. How do you seek out which company you think you believe in for the long term? Well, we really believe in you know, what Warren Buffett always says, that you want to invest within your circle of competence, invest in companies and industries that you really understand deeply and you feel like you have an edge there. So that's what we're doing. We're building larger positions in our favorite names. Of course, we're always looking for new ideas and fresh ideas. And, mm -hmm. but often you end up buying more of the things that you truly believe in. Talk to us about the new ideas, the fresh ideas, the behavior of finance. Is that, how do you ensure that when you're not being barraged with emails, because I know you're a man who refuses to, to have to be responsive in that way, but more be able to be within the reading and the focus, how are you ensuring that you're always testing, stress testing your own ideas? We're constantly um, reading as much as possible. We're so, we're so excited about Annie, Annie Duke's new book about quitting. Yeah. <laughs> and we're hoping to, you know, to, to all of us in the research department will read it, hopefully engage with her and learn about the things that she's thought about. You know, Adam Grant's book, Think Again. Yeah. These books that force you to think about how you don't get tied into a perspective and are unwilling to change your ideas. And, of course, you know, Dick Thaler and Daniel Kahneman and the behavioral finance experts have really taught us that, to be afraid of confirmation bias and making sure that you're willing to look at all ideas and not be locked into uh, what you've always thought. So we think it's so, so important, the science of behavioral finance, we can't get enough of it and are constantly looking to see how we can improve and understand each of our weaknesses on our research team. It's interesting, of course, that you yourself have been the subject of many a book. I'm thinking David Rubenstein's got a new book out, launched, I think, last month, and you're a focus of the chapter, your ways in which you invest. Why then, at the moment, do you find yourself doubling down in your favorite names, particularly when Madison Square Gardens, you own it you sh and you also share within your letters to your investors, that you're always very, look, this hasn't performed as we think. We don't, un how do you continue to think, okay, but that is the right stock, and I know it will come good in the longer term? Well, we work with our team. You know, we have an experienced group of people who've been together for a very long time. I was having lunch the other day with uh, Ken Kurt and Tim Feidler, two of our long-term leaders, executive vice presidents, and talking about, you know, these industries that we know really well and why it's so important to be building those positions. So right now, Madison Square Garden Entertainment, we think it's selling at over a 70% discount to its private market value. Mm -hmm. That rarely, if ever, has happened at Ariel, where we find names that cheap. The last time was at 08 and 09, at the height of the financial crisis. Maybe you found a few names that were that cheap. Our <laughs> overall portfolio is selling at about a 40, uh, over a 40% discount, one of the largest in our 39-year history. But again, we think Madison Square Garden has this, you know, this iconic property. There's no across the street from the garden. And as we were talking about it, people want to get back and get back to seeing concerts, seeing teams. And I was talking to the management a couple weeks ago and they're saying, you know, the Billy Joel uh, residency is yeah. still selling out. You know, I see the cool. lines. <laughs> yeah. And uh, their new sphere that they're building in Las Vegas, we've gone and had the hard hat tour. It's a thrilling uh, new entertainment vehicle. It's really exciting. And we think once they get it proved in Las Vegas, they can take it around the world. You know, this is huge new way of people consuming uh, that kind of entertainment. It was interesting. David Einhorn yesterday did an interview with Shanali Basak, who was just on. He, a hedge fund manager, but a value investor, and was talking about how there are very few of the really focused value investors out there anymore. In fact, he sounded pretty, pretty dour. He was saying he didn't know if value investing was ever really going to come back. But he did say no one knows how to value anything anymore is that what's going wrong why why the market has Madison Square Gardens entertainment so deeply discounted we do we not know how to value assets at the moment 
I think it's a temporary uh, phenomenon. You know, sometimes markets go crazy. And Are they crazy we, right now? We think so. We've never seen this kind of volatility up and down. You know, all of us here, you know, the, internet, the ups and downs interday is something mm. that just never, ever experienced. But I think, you know, volatility should be your friend. It should create right opportunities where stocks are being mispriced, research isn't being done well. People become so short-term focused today in our society. So we think those of us that are left that are willing to look out three, five years out over the horizon, you know, looking out to see when the storm passes, what this company will truly look like, what kind of cash it will be generating. I think that way of value investing is always going to be uh, something that will work in our, in, our, in our markets. We had a guest on, a uh, strategist from a, a bank, and Barry Bannister was saying we're all forced to be day traders now. Are you forced to in some ways just to know, oh, this is when I want to top up. This is the right value. Or are you dollar cost averaging still? Are you still thinking I'm not getting involved in this day-to-day -day volatility? Again, it creates opportunities. So we're probably trading more than on average when a name that you love a lot is down 5 10% in a week. We're going to be in there adding to that position, uh, having a lower cost for that position. And that's worked for us over these 39 years, whether it's the 1987 crash or, again, the 08 and 09 pri problems that were so severe or uh, the COVID crisis. We found that if you're willing to you know, do your homework and buy more of those names that you truly believe in, you know, it works out. So, we're doing more trading because there's more opportunity caused by this volatility. Of course, the 87 crash sort of earned your spurs in many ways. You proved your resilience. Of course, you'd founded in 83. You now have 16 billion thereabouts under management. It showed that you could, with this patient capital, still win out. Is this going to be another one of those moments where people earn their right to be thought of as legendary investors? I think so. You know, it does take courage to uh, buy when everyone is fearful, you know, and, and Warren always talks about you want to be greedy when others are fearful. You know, and the great John Templeton used to always say you want to buy when there's maximum pessimism, but it's harder to do. Mm. So, for example, another favorite name of ours is Paramount Global. Yeah. Well, all morning this morning I'm texting with John Miller from our team about another recommendation from a, the sell side saying, you know, sell Paramount Global or, you know, numbers are not going to be what you expect. Everyone hates it. And while everyone hates it, that creates opportunity, we think. so. Um, we're just going to continue to do its work for us for these last 40 years, even if it has been a very painful, uh, painful 10 months. What about when everyone loves one of your names? You've been very astute with some of the energy names, I think, or indeed the potash names and fertilizers. I mean, the, the extraordinary run-up we did see in commodities has come off the boil. But how, how do you think about when to exit when you're like, okay, this has been our run? When stocks get expensive, you know, we said we like to find stocks that are selling at over a 40% discount when we buy them. Mm -hmm. And once a stock is no longer selling at a discount, it's at a premium to the real value of the company, then we start to scale out. Or, of course, if we lose faith in the, management's, uh, the management team and their ability to create a plan to win for the future, mm -hmm. if you start to see that the competitive mode is not as deep as you thought it was, there's going to be reason to sell. Or if you're questioning the capital allocation decisions of, their, uh, of the management team. You know, people are often making acquisitions at the wrong time to grow for growth's sake. Those can be reasons for us to exit a position. Interestingly, you are, of course, a man that doesn't just manage money along with the rest of your team, but you and Melanie Hobson, both on boards, both understanding those management teams, understanding how to guide, to, to give the outside perspective. You're Nike, McDonald's, I believe you've been on many more. How hard is it to be a management team? How hard is it to be on a board of directors right now in this environment? Well, I think being on the boards uh, are great opportunities. I know a lot of people, of course, are in private equity, and of course, all private equity folks sit on lots of boards. Uh, Warren Buffett has you know, talked about how serving on boards makes you a better investor, mm. makes you a better business person. So for us, you know, we learn so much when you're in the boardroom about what a good management team does. How, you know, being on the board of McDonald's when Jim Cantalupo came in at CEO, as CEO and created a plan to win and was able to get the stock from, you know, really all-time lows to a great recovery. So you, you get to see great management. You learn more about industries. It's really a, a great place just to be. And I feel privileged to be in the boardroom. To your question about today, you know, I think it's uh, this COVID crisis caused challenges that none of us had ever seen before. So inevitably, you have more meetings, you have uh, you know, longer meetings, you're trying to figure out what this is, the, the war uh, also, uh, what the war in Ukraine means for your companies, and how it's going to challenge all different aspects of your financial models. 
So we are busier. It is a harder time. Uh, and these things are so uncertain. You know, we never had seen a global crisis like the COVID in the last, you know, since 100 years ago. And again, this war just came out of nowhere. No one saw what was happening uh, with Russia. And so um, it is a difficult time, a different type of time. What do you look at to navigate whether this difficult, uncertain time is being priced in to the market? We've got an audience question, for example, asking if you look at the VIX for volatility, the, the fear gauge, which many feel has been oddly suppressed and not at capitulation levels, not hitting that 40 level. Do you look at that for a sense, a gut check on what's now in the market? We don't look at the VIX, uh, but what we do look at is investors' intelligence mm. to see when there's a lot, a lot of pessimism or when there's a lot of optimism. Right now, the numbers are very, very low for optimists in the investor intelligence data. I think only 20, under 25% bulls, which yeah. is uh, often, again, a bullish sign when you have that kind of negativity. So there are certain data points we look at from a contrarian standpoint that we help guide, help guide our decision making. Going back to David Einhorn. Do you think value investing will come back? Is, did it never go away? I mean, what did you make of that comment? Well, it's been such a long, long 12 years or so. Where, you know, a bull run, a, yeah. Yeah, a few little bright spots. Uh, but no, we're still true, true believers. And, and uh, you know, you just go back and reread you know, some of Warren Buffett's greatest uh, comments. You know, you talk to your value managers that are left. I, I saw Bill Nygren the other day. You know, we talked to Bill Miller and my friend Tom Russo. and. You know, the uh, Staley Cates at Southeastern, all of us are sort of feel like we're at this club, even though it's a smaller club than it used to be. <laughs> but we get together and talk and share ideas and uh, sort of, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way when you can find others who are, are like minds. Mm. You know, I had, uh, I had lunch the other day with the great investor, Ralph Wanger from the Acorn Fund, so, you know, legendary investor. And just to see that quirkiness and his unique insights into the markets. You know, you can talk to great value-oriented people who can think differently than the crowd. It can inspire you and give you that confidence. Sometimes you need when the markets are unsettled and uncomfortable. What about the younger generation coming up who haven't lived through 87, haven't invested through 87, who want to be a legendary value investor? Are you seeing them? Are you managing to have like-minded conversations at the moment? Are we seeing a younger generation being nervous about this market, being put off, having been excited about it within the COVID run-up? It's harder to find young talent that are true value investors. It's, it's for sure. And it's partly because growth has done so well and people have gotten excited about it. But it's also, of course, everyone has watched how much wealth has been created in private equity. So these things go and the trends come and go. And now everyone's rushing into private equity. Everyone wants to be a multi-billionaire overnight. They can't be? Right. Are you yeah, dispelling yeah. that myth? <laughs> so, and so that makes it harder sometimes to find people. But we find those, you know, those uh, those those gems that are out there. We have a you know, dynamic young person that went to the University of Chicago High School where I went to, who's a, a Princeton grad like I was, and you know he's on the sell side here in New York, and he's going to come and join us, and we're just thrilled. You know, it's just, uh, you can, and it's funny. It's one of those great stories where he saw us coming and speaking about investing to the high school. You know. Uh, Charlie Bobrinsko and our vice chairman, we go back to our old high school and talk to the students every year. And it's kind of neat to see that, you know, they remember and then some of them say, oh, yeah, maybe I'd like to be a value investor and maybe I'd like to work at Ariel someday. And so sometimes volunteering is helpful. In a way, your, patient's commi your patient commitment to certain stocks is almost like loyalty. And you seem to show quite a lot of loyalty in just we were talking off stage and saying how you've just been to, you know, the celebration of a life of your old basketball coach when you were basketball captain and varsity captain over at Princeton. Do you see yourself as loyal? Do you think people need to be a little bit more loyal, loyal at the moment? Oh, for sure. I, I, I think that, that is a, there's not as much loyalty in our society these days. And again, part of it's this short-term transactional nature. So many of our leaders are looked at as transactional and not people who are sticking to core values over the long term. And that was one of the things I'm so proud of Princeton basketball, Coach Carrillo created a, a way of playing the Princeton offense where people share the ball. They're always thinking about their teammates first. And um, that's when more than half of the players that played for him came back for the memorial service. And I think it's, it's guided our life after we left, left Princeton. You, know, you want to be engaged and involved and helping others and good things happen. And I always tell people, I was volunteering for Princeton when I, I met Melody Hobson, you know, helping to recruit minority students for Princeton. I end up with my most valuable player. And so, 
the sense of teamwork is something I think is important and, and loyalty is very important. I'm sure you're many people's MVP. We want to thank John Rogers for his time, his dedication, his loyalty to sharing some of his lessons, the books he reads. We really want to thank you for your time today. John Rogers, of course, of Aerial Investments. Now it is time for a coffee break. It is time to get up, stretch your legs, go and network. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Here's to the ones that we got Cheers to the wish you were here but you're not Cause the drinks bring back all the memories Of everything we've been through Toast to the ones here today Toast to the ones that we lost on the way Cause the drinks bring back all the memories And the memories bring back memories Bring back your There's a time that I remember When I did not know no pain When I believed in forever Everything will stay the same Now my heart feel like December When somebody say your name Cause I can't reach out to call you But I know I will one day yeah. Everybody hurts sometimes Everybody hurts someday yeah, yeah. But everything gonna be alright I'm gonna raise a glass and say yeah. Here's to the ones that we got Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not Cause the drinks bring back all the memories Of everything we've been through Toast to the ones here today Toast to the ones that we lost on the way Cause the drinks bring back all the memories And the memories bring back, memories bring back your Memories bring back, memories bring back your there's a time that I remember When I never felt so lost When I felt all of the hatred Used to cry out for the stars oh, yeah. Now my heart feel like an ember And it's lighting up the dark I'll carry these torches for ya But you know I'll never drop Yeah Everybody hurts sometimes Everybody hurts someday yeah, yeah. But everything gonna be alright a glass and say, hey. Here's to the ones that we got. Oh, Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not. Cause the drinks bring back all the memories of everything we've been through. Toast to the ones here today. Toast to the ones that we lost on the way. Cause the drinks bring back all the memories. And the memories bring back, memories bring back your. Tight. Took a while since the last guy Found out you were a slow find Cause you never gave up on me You're fixing things, painting my walls Leaving your laundry in the back hall You're barely gone and you got a call So why do you even leave? We gotta figure it out We already know how Baby, it's nothing new Four years down the road Nobody needs a vote
Sunday morning, man, she woke up fighting mad. Bitching and moaning on and on about the time I had. And by Tuesday, you could say that girl was good as gone. And then when Thursday came around, I was all. And I want a hundred bucks on a scratch off ticket, bought two twelve packs and a tank of gas with it. She swore they were a waste of time, all but she was wrong. I was calling number five on the radio station, want a four day, three night beach vacation, deep sea seniorita fishing down. She heard about my newfound luck on that FM dial. And it's crazy how lately now it just seems to come in away. What I thought was gonna be the death of me was my saving grace. It's got me thinking that her leaving is the Scratch off ticket, bought two 12 packs and a tank of gas with it. She swore they were a waste of time, all but she was wrong. And I was calling number five on the radio station, one a four day, three night beach vacation. Deep sea seniorita fishing down.
queen Sitting pretty on the prairie, baby, I'm your huckleberry, let me hold you well, This six-gun sugar's got a hairpin trigger like I told you Through the strange light, chasing all them green lights, throwing up the shade for a little bit of sunshine. Hit me with them good vibes, pictures on my phone, like everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Yeah, crazy lately, I'm confirming, trying to rob myself of something. You just trying to get a word, and life is not fair. I've been working on my tunnel vision, trying to get a new prescription, taking swings and even missing, but I don't care.
Sleep to late night, sitting alone. Conversations with a stranger I barely know. Swearing this will be the last, but it probably won't. I got nothing left to lose or use. Or do my bad habits lead to what? to with a stranger I barely know swearing this will be the last but it probably won't I got nothing left to lose or use or do my bad habits lead to I hate I stare in space and I know I lose control of the things that I say yeah, I was looking for a way out yeah, now I can't escape nothing happens after two it's true it's true my bad habits lead to you I might be better on my own. I hate you blowing up my phone. I wish I never met your ass. Sometimes it be like that, but I'm not myself. The night you're gone, there ain't no way I'm moving on. I'm not afraid to need you back. Sometimes it be like that. We both wanna love, we both wanna slide. We both wanna argue and say we're both right. You wanna hug and kiss, we deny. Sometimes it be like that, but I'm not myself. The night you're gone, there ain't no way I'm moving on. I'm not afraid to need you back. Sometimes it be like that. Cause you see what you find. Wasn't even supposed to be with you. And it gets crazy in the night. I cannot sleep. And I could keep you up. 
Again, but I made myself a new friend. His name is Jose, and there's no way he's gonna let me let us in. Mr. Cuervo, he just knows that I've been feeling kind of low. Cause you left me in a cloud of smoke. Somebody take my phone. It looks like I crossed a line. Cause I called you. Please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes.
Daddy lights with the boys at the bar, pouring whiskey on our soul. Double shots, cheap tequila, keep the tab open and take my visa. My girlfriend says she wanted to go, and you know it's hard to try telling her no. So throw another drink in the mix. Let's see how many she can double fist. Ain't no loss, but she's sipping on rock claws. No telling what trouble she might cause. It's enough on the bar. It's the third one she got us kicked out of so far. Her song comes on, and she's louder than the cover band singing along. Can't white girl wasted, call her basic. But there ain't no loss when she's drinking white claws. She knows she got it. Oh, oh, oh. She plays hard to get, but all these games get hard to play. And she posts pictures. Oh, oh. Of everywhere she goes when she goes on holiday. But tonight she's downtown. Mm -mm. Traded in the diamonds and champagne for Chardonnay. She's just dancing. Oh, oh, oh. Make the Feel like some day. Please take your seats. The program is about to begin.
Please welcome to the stage Thrive Capital founder and managing partner, Joshua Kushner, and Thrive Capital general partner, Kareem Zaki, with Bloomberg Sarah McBride. Morning. Thank you for joining us today. With me, I have Kareem Zaki and Josh Kushner. Um, Josh is a founder and general partner of Thrive Capital and co-founder of Cadre and Oscar Health. And um, Kareem is a general partner at Thrive Capital and co-founder of numerous health tech companies, including Cedar and Cadence. And I'm sure you all are very familiar with Thrive. It raised $3 billion earlier this year for its eighth fund and has been investing hard in companies like Stripe, Plaid, Robinhood, Slack. And um, so I thought we would just begin by, if you could tell me how it is you came to start Thrive, Josh, and who some of your mentors were or what VCs you looked up to when you were founding the firm. Yeah, so first off, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we are big Bloomberg fans and considered an honor to be with you all. Um, you know, when we started the firm, uh, there are different firms that we admired, um, but we always made a decision that we wanted to not look like anyone else. We just wanted to be ourselves. And when we started the firm, uh, one of our early investors uh, spoke to us about how as firms scale, they start to lose a sense of who they are. And uh, I had this conversation with him where I said, why don't I actually tell you who I want to be in 10 years and why don't we just start there? So we took a very first principles approach to what we wanted to do, which was we wanted to be a firm that built companies and invested in companies at any stage, in any geography, and in any sector. And this was deeply controversial at the time. Because in 2011, when we raised our first institutional fund, you were either an early stage fund or a later stage fund. You were either a consumer fund or a software fund. You were either a US fund or European fund. And our view was we wanted to really be hands-on, on the ground, building things ourselves, but also partner with category-defining companies um, and really help them realize their full potential. And as we think about the firm today, it really works as a flywheel. We are building stuff ourselves, which really enables us to appreciate how hard it is to actually build. Um, we are investing in early stage companies, and as a result of us building, those early stage companies actually want us to be their partners. And we also have the opportunity to invest in later stage companies because when we approach uh, these founders who are building these really unique, already scaled businesses, they view us very similar to them and then the fact that we get those incredible lessons from all the names that you mentioned, we can actually take those back to the things that we're building and the things that we're investing in at the early stages. So it's hard to appreciate that now mm -hmm. when so many firms are stage agnostic and sector agnostic. I'm just curious, at the time you had this conversation with an investor who's now an LP in your firm, what did that person say? Were they skeptical? Did they support you? Yeah, I think you know we, um, we feel very grateful to have incredible partners at Thrive, and we feel really fortunate to work for incredible institutions that do a ton of good in the world. Non-for-profits, university endowments, foundations, hospital systems. Uh, but when we started, um, many of them uh, didn't really understand our strategy, but we had always believed that building something that worked in a flywheel that actually enabled us to kind of get these insights, get these lessons, to really ultimately be the most meaningful partner to our founders was what we wanted to accomplish. And um, we figured it would enable us to scale and do the exact same thing. So we are doing the exact same thing with our $3 billion fund as we were doing with our first $40 million fund, and that's something that we're proud of. And I, and I think the industry also was evolving that allowed an opportunity for a new type of venture or technology investment firm to be built. I think venture a long time ago was kind of viewed as a cottage industry. Maybe you were backing science projects. The life of a company was three to four years. You were maybe trying to sell it to Cisco. You were trying to just get through this one milestone. <coughs> and now we're seeing, we're seeing that technology is not just a niche asset class. 
it is this transformation across every industry. And it's growing from just trying to build companies for a couple of years to transforming industries over 10 years, sometimes decades. And when you kind of take that lens, this idea of just focusing on seed or just focusing on finance or healthcare or infrastructure misses the picture of kind of what's happening behind these trends. And then you have these founders who want to build much more ambitious companies. And they don't want to have to have a different partner for every question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm an early stage company. I need to ask the product person. Or I'm you know, growing right now. I need to ask the business person or mm -hmm. the growth mindset. What does it mean to actually have an investor, a partner, who understands all the stages? <clears throat> and not just because the firm says they do it all. Because even if a firm says they do it all, they have different teams. They have a seed team. They have an early team. They have a growth team. They have a public team. And so it's a really disjointed experience for the founder. And so what does it mean for us to align and not just say we're here for part of the journey? Right. We're here for all of the journey. And also when you're trying to identify these trends, if you're just looking at what's right in front of you, because my firm says they do this, or we only look at this area, you only have one piece of the puzzle, and maybe you're missing the broader picture of what's happening, which is a multi-decade, maybe a century-long trend around this ripple of technology transforming every aspect of the economy. So in setting it up, you went against the conventional wisdom. Is there anything you continue to do today that's against the conventional wisdom, in, for example, in the types of companies you back, or um, anything else you're doing? Yeah, I think. Part of it stems from building companies, which I spend a good amount of time doing, but I think the whole firm uh -huh. spends time on this. I think sometimes you talk to limited partners or people ask, is a former founder a better investor or you know, a classically trained investor uh -huh. lead to better results? And I think our answer is both. These businesses are becoming much more complex. Uh -huh. I think the investor needs to be much more multi-dimensional around, uh, around it. And I think what's also really important is it allows you to kind of take on more ambitious opportunities because as technology expands from just impacting other tech industries or selling tech to other tech companies but going across industries, sometimes to innovate in healthcare and financial services needs to be bigger from day one. It needs to be multi-stakeholders. We need to work with the existing industry as well as the new innovators. And being able to build companies, I think, allows us to bring in more people in the ecosystem early on to, to drive and do that. And I think the second thing is just having a firm that's a very long-term lens how do we use time horizon as a competitive advantage <clears throat> when we invest? Because if you're only focused on the stage, how do I get one company from one stage to another? You're going to bet on companies that have inflection points in 6 or 12 months. And sometimes that's true. Some of the most innovative companies take a couple years to build. And if you're really forced to think on a short-term horizon, you might be missing some of the most ambitious, exciting companies. And that's allowed us to innovate, I think, in financial services and healthcare. Right. before most industries were investing behind that, or at the intersection of hardware and software, <coughs> like investing in companies like SpaceX, but earlier stage businesses now that are innovating in hearing aids or surgical devices. So um, let's talk a little bit about your consumer investments, because you're in quite a few, like Warby Parker and Glossier. What's your thinking on, do you prefer direct to consumer, and what's your strategy around the consumer investments? I think we, again, I think, one, we try to keep a generalist lens. Uh -huh. And where we kind of view is technologically, is technological innovation is not monolithic, or these breakthroughs aren't monolithic. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about sometimes the consumer space, it's less around what do we think is most interesting consumer today, uh -huh. but what are some of the most exciting and most powerful trends happening broadly. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is the growth and the power of the creator and having a direct voice to individuals, and that can be around already <coughs> recognizable individuals, like Kim Kardashian and Skims, which were right. investors behind, but also new people coming up on new mediums and platforms, and we invested in Patreon and Twitch and things that kind of enabled a whole new category of individuals to kind of lead and have an authentic voice. Yeah, the thing that I would add is um, every single one of our businesses is a brand and that brand is selling to an end customer. Uh -huh. So um, in many respects, uh, consumer is seen as selling directly to all of us, but Stripe and GitHub are selling to developers, and Airtable and Slack are selling to enterprises. And we think brand, um, coupled with an extraordinary product and a great go-to-market, is important across all industries. Um, and I think people focus on you know, our investments in things like Instagram and Spotify and Twitch, but at the end of the day, 
uh, there are a ton of shared lessons and learnings across all these businesses, irrespective of the end customer. So how important is it to have a celebrity if you're trying to build a consumer brand? You just mentioned quite a few where you don't have a celebrity, but increasingly will that be more important going forward, like Kim Kardashian with Skims? or? I think um, for all of our businesses, we try our best to think about um, distribution. Uh -huh. And obviously, the most important thing uh, around ultimately selling a product is the quality of that product. Right. Um, but businesses like Warby and Fanatics and some of the platforms that I mentioned, uh, they had extraordinary products which enabled them to ultimately realize uh, incredible go-to-markets. Um, those that have existing distribution, though, where uh, a business that they're ultimately selling uh, is very authentic to who they are can lead to really extraordinary outcomes as well. And speaking of outcomes, a lot of companies that had planned to IPO this year are forced to delay those plans. You guys are in Stripe, which had been often spoken about as an IPO candidate this year. What, what do you think of the outlook uh, for next year and beyond? What, what are you anticipating for your companies, the ones that are getting close to exit stage? Uh, I'm sure there's lots of people in this room who probably have a better perspective on you know, what the market's exactly going to look like uh -huh. 12 to 24 months. You know, we don't live under a rock. Like, we obviously know that valuations have shifted and multiples have kind of evolved over time. And it feels like everyone's obsessed right now talking about the multiples and where prices uh -huh. trade, um, which we get. It's, it's been a big shift. It's obviously jarring. It's things that we're aware of. But we're also aware that valuations of companies are multiples times earnings. And we spend a lot of time really thinking about what are the earning power about businesses and the real core operating metrics driving these businesses, not for the next quarter, not even for the next year, but over the next five years. And when you're trying to think about the next five years and the opportunities for companies around that to exit and grow and, and create value for the shareholders and for the employees and the founders who are building it, a model's not going to tell you that answer. It's too far out. It's really the market the dynamic, the product, the founder's positioning mm -hmm. that's really going to transform all those elements where ultimately is where we lean in, really thinking from a product lens and then <coughs> zooming out and being like, what are the really big macro trends that are going to drive and propel a company to continue to compound at really fast growth rates, which I think is one of the things that's challenging about venture is I think you have to have macro conviction. What's mm -hmm. this big tailwind that I'm going to invest behind, but then actually have micro precision in the individual company. You could have been in the 90s and say e-commerce is going to be a really big deal. But if you didn't invest in Amazon or eBay, you didn't really participate in that trend in a meaningful way. Right. And so how do you step back and identify the things that are really taking over, which is why we try to keep the generalist lens be zoomed out, uh -huh. because we don't miss one of these really breakout trends. But at the end of the day, like you have to make sure there's the building blocks, the environment, the setup, the team, the founder, the market, to really get something out, not just quickly, but with real velocity to explode and take over an industry on the time horizons we're talking about. And that's where I think a lot of the founding and the building lens tied with really trying to be students of the market and be professional investors kind of comes together. What's your best bet on an eBay-like trend that might be developing now without people being aware of it so much? Yeah. Uh, again, like we want to zoom out to kind yeah. of see some of these things. I think where we're starting to see a lot of really interesting innovation is we're seeing kind of the intersection of software and hardware come together in new ways. We used to think about software as a, one element and hardware as a different element, and then they would try to come together. And now we have companies from day one thinking about building around this. Uh -huh. And I think you could have seen Tesla and SpaceX kind of being one of the first innovators in that, but we're really seeing acceleration now with all the founders who are coming through the door, innovating across a lot of these different dimensions. I think healthcare is also having an interesting moment right now. Obviously, we've been talking about digital health for a while. I think it's going to be kind of a reawakening of digital health post-COVID. One, you know, physicians have a lot more interactions with the new ways that we can treat patients, but also patients have gotten a lot more comfortable with it. Right. And it's not so formed because we were, you know, unfortunately forced into that with COVID. And now you're actually seeing insurance companies and the government wake up to the value of it. And so now they're paying for digital health the way that maybe they pay for a normal doctor visit. And that, I think, is going to really help accelerate some of the things that we're seeing in the market in a way that's much faster than we saw in the previous decade. When people talk about software and hardware coming together, it's often in a transportation example, like Tesla's, like Rockets. Is there any other example that would be more of use in daily life that uh, you know that isn't a transportation element? 
Yeah, we're starting uh, to see a lot more on the medical device side in particular. Um, again, I think the Moore's Law components of hardware and chips has kind of reached a point um, that is actually enabling a greater um, percentage of people to ultimately focus on these problems. But I think coupling um, what we believe to be somewhat commoditized uh, with actually software to enable continuous improvement is a trend that we are tremendously excited about. And you know, you can think of Tesla as a car or you can think about it as a computer on wheels. And I think as we start to think about um, lots of other things that are deeply impactful in our lives, we'll start to see a lot more transformation in that capacity. And one interesting example I think is like Apple. Obviously think about it as a hardware company, but increasingly it's a software ecosystem that keeps people tied in to it as well. What about brain machine interfaces? Those might be another example. And you mentioned SpaceX and Tesla. Are you Neuralink investors as well? Uh, We're not. OK. That's the Elon Musk brain machine interface company. But could you see that as a promising area? There are so many companies starting in that field right now. Is it something you look at? We, we have not spent time on that, so don't think uh, we're the best to speak to it. OK. Um, and then just uh, thinking some more um, about the type of firm you are. I know that about a year ago, you registered as an investment advisor with the SEC. What was the thinking behind that? Was that to enable more crypto investments, or are there other things you can do with that type of designation? Yeah, I think from our lens, you know, we've, we're looking for technology companies. Uh -huh. We're stage agnostic. I think increasingly, we're seeing, and we saw in the last couple of years, a lot of those companies have gone public. Right. And so we care less if it's a public or private company. We want to find really innovative technology companies that are still early in their growth curve and kind of haven't leveled off. Uh -huh. And sometimes companies wait a long time to go public in that journey, right. and we can participate as private investors. But just because an interesting company, maybe you could look at Shopify went public in 2015, you know, at $2 billion, is that a company that would be interesting to participate and kind of follow its journey? Of course, and so we kind of think the distinction between private and public is a bit arbitrary, and, and we just wanted to be in a position that we didn't feel constrained by whether a company was pu private or public to, to think about whether this is a really innovative technology in the early innings of transforming the space. Hmm. Um, and so uh, can you give me some examples of some companies that you've invested in once they've gone public? or? So um, we invested in Zoom at the IPO okay. uh, because, again, we thought Zoom was very early in its life cycle, uh -huh. uh, incredible product market fit, and uh, was very early in its adoption. Um, but it's not something we do often. And when we do it, um, the return threshold for what we invest in um, on the public side is no different than what we do on the private side. Um, we are technology investors, and we're very focused on making sure that we're working with really exceptional founders that we know extremely well uh, that are building products that we think are going after very large markets. Um, so that's an example. So speaking of founders, um, I know that you were co-founders of Kadra, and um, Ryan Williams, the CEO, recently stepped aside as CEO of that company. What's <coughs> your thinking on when it's time for a founder to move on? What was the thought process there? And, and when is it right for a new person to lead one of your portfolio companies? Yeah, Ryan is um, really an exceptional founder and has built an incredible product that has done exceptionally well for its end customer. And he's really scaled the business to uh, an incredible, incredible point. Um, as a firm, we've had a founder first mindset. We've always been of the belief uh, that we are investing in people, and those people are ultimately the ones that deserve all the credit. Um, you know, you won't see us on Twitter. We're not blogging. I think this is the first thing I've done like this in 10 years, because we actually don't want to take credit for their success. Mm -hmm. They are the heroes in this journey, and we are very fortunate to support them. Um, but sometimes people like Ryan raise their hand and say, you know, I actually think this thing could be so much bigger. And how do I bring in someone who's exceptional? And he did exactly that. So uh, this is his decision. He came to us. And we wanted to do our best to support him in that decision. And he's still full time at the business. He's the chairman of the business. He's probably working uh, as hard, or if not even harder, than he was prior. 
um, and we feel really fortunate to be partnered with him and uh, with, with Jared Kaplan, the new CEO of the business. How much does the downturn in the market just make it tougher and drive someone faster to a decision like that? I think um, every situation is unique uh -huh. and every situation is specific to a specific company. So I think it's a hard thing to speak to. I think some founders in these moments will be emboldened and actually lean in and feel like it's a market share gaining moment for them and their company and um, some will uh, think, how do I actually bring in people with certain expertise that can kind of help me go to the next level? You know, at Thrive as a firm, um, we think the reason why it works is because we all bring something very different to the table. Um, we learn from each other, uh, we grow from each other, um, and every time we feel like we're not doing something well, we actually try to find someone who can actually help us be better in that area. And I think that's what the best founders do. Um, the best founders are the ones who are the most self-aware. They're the ones who are constantly thinking about what they're good at and what they can be better at and trying their best to improve in both areas and bringing in people that can support them in both areas. Mm -hmm. um, Karim, do you have anything to add to that? Or uh, is that the firm philosophy? That yeah, I mean, I think there's a deep alignment. I, mean, <clears throat> I think one of the things about Thrive is we're a really small team uh -huh. and how we've done that. And the reason we're a small team is because we want to be collaborative. Um, I don't know anyone who said I had a really productive meeting with 30 people in a room trying to talk. And that's the size of most partnerships these days. Mm -hmm. And so how do you engage and work as a team and align a lot of these philosophies? And so in that respect, you know, a lot of these things we work really closely together on and really aligned and mostly because we want to learn from each other and really help step back and support companies in the most robust ways. Now these businesses are complex and multidimensional, uh -huh. but also to identify some of these things that are really interesting. And you're still on the board of Oscar, right? I know they said that they were aiming for profitability next year. Is, is that still the case? I'm on the board of Oscar. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, given that it's a public company, I'll let them speak for themselves. OK, great. Had to ask. And yeah. there's one other thing I have to ask. I'm sure And Kelly is very proud of that answer, and as is Oscar's <laughs> IR department. Um, I'm sure many of you saw some comments made by a particular musician, uh, Kanye West, uh, in recent days. And he was saying disparaging things about one of your most successful portfolio companies. Um, and Kim Kardashian, the founder of the company, I just have to ask, what, what do you, what's your relationship like with Kanye West? <laughs> <laughs> um, I already see the phones going up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, getting called out by Kanye on Instagram was not on last week's bingo card for me. Um, but, you know, as a firm, we're incredibly heads down. Uh -huh. um, we do our best to kind of keep to ourselves and uh, are entirely focused on doing whatever we can to be the most meaningful partner to our founders and supporting those founders. And we feel really fortunate to work with that business in particular and to support Kim and Jens and Emma and all the people involved. and. Um, feel very grateful for that. On, on a personal level and a human level, um, you know, I think some of the comments that were made specifically around anti-Semitism are, are, are disappointing to me. And I'll leave it at that. I think this is an investing conference, um, but I'll leave it at that. Have you spoken to him since then? <laughs> is this TMZ? <laughs> Or is, is this Daily a Mail? TMZ Come on, Sarah. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Inquiring minds want to know. I know. <laughs> we are heads down and focus as a firm, and I think we've done a really good job of avoiding distractions. And um, I think um, that is our ethos as an organization. And, you know, we just keep our heads down and stay focused. So tell me about your newest partner, Bob Iger. How did you come to know him, and what's it like working with him? I know he's only been at the firm like a month or so, but. Yeah, I mean, we revere Bob. Uh -huh. um, you know, when I think about, you know, the most extraordinary executives over the last, you know, century, he is one of them. Um, as a firm, we all feel like we're early in our careers, and we have a ton to learn, and we feel really grateful um, to have him uh, and to learn from him. And um, I think uh, what we're most excited about, about the idea of him being involved in the firm is 
Um, a lot of our founders are building really audacious businesses and having the capacity to spend time with him is something that uh, those that have already done it have benefited tremendously from and those that will in the future will benefit tremendously from and, and we feel really honored to have him involved and, and truly humbled. I want everyone here to leave with some advice they can use. <clears throat> so I was thinking of asking you both, if you were giving advice to someone going to college now, what would you tell them to major in? Kareem, I know your major is actually very relevant to your work today. Would you suggest somebody find something like that mm -hmm. that they're interested yeah. in? Or? It, it looks relevant now at the time I thought I was going to be a doctor and on my way to med school and uh -huh. it shifted at the last minute, but and you, you know, were a healthcare economics major, is that right? Okay. Exactly, okay. exactly. But I tried to diversify a little bit, so I studied economics, and I think one of the things that I really took away f from that is how do you think about abstract problems? And so <coughs> my main piece of advice is pick a major that teaches you how to think. Okay. And in some ways, that's computer science, and other ways, it could be bioengineering. Mm -hmm. But the world is changing so quickly that to be able to pick what you're studying now and assume that's what the world's going to look like 20 years is challenging. And so how do you create a flexible mind? Is, uh, it picks up in that lines with that. Josh, you said that you had a couple interesting recommendations for kids. Yeah. So for all the college students who are watching this on their Bloomberg terminals right now, <laughs> um, my advice would not be what major you would take um, as much as um, I think college is the last moment in your life where you don't have a resume mm -hmm. and you can make friends based on interests and passions um, and you are not orienting the conversation towards, hi, this is who I am and this is what I've done. Um, and my advice for, for anyone would just be, these are the friends that you're going to make for the rest of your life. So Great answer. And with that, thanks to both of you. I really appreciate your joining. Thank you for us. having us. Thank you. What could be more important than telling stories where everyone has a voice? That's not just good journalism, it's a responsibility. The intent of the New Voices program really is to improve our coverage. And in early 2018, we decided to do a real analysis of our guests on TV and quotes in our stories. At that time, only 10% of our outside guests being brought onto TV for interviews were women. We knew that we really needed to do something intentional to change that. The challenge is that a woman spokesperson who are usually as good and as able and have as much potential, they tend to get overlooked. And I think this New Voices program exactly addressed that challenge. I was really driven to appear on TV because I am a big advocate for women in investment management and you cannot be what you cannot see. What have you thought to yourself about how to potentially participate in that kind of wealth? It's a great question. So I think we at Florida a and to be able to be heard, I think, is one of the best gifts that you can give anyone, uh, whether it's heard on TV, heard in life. So the fact that the New Voices program allows people to be heard, I think it's just phenomenal. Women just need a push, they need encouragement, they need the skills, and we can help them do that with a New Voices program. We decided we at Bloomberg could sponsor intensive media training for senior female experts in cities around the world to not only address the gap that they were facing, but to also help us identify and discover new qualified female experts. The reason why I think the New Voices program is so important is that it really empowers women. Yes, in media, but also in their jobs, in their careers. It gives them a platform. It gives them a voice. After I came out of New Voices, I was able to give concise responses, crisp responses, and responses that really communicated what I wanted the audience to know. If you put your mind to something, push your boundaries a little bit, get out of your comfort zone, anything's possible. We started this program with 10% representation of outside female guests on Bloomberg TV. We tripled that within three years. And we want to keep pushing for the betterment of our coverage, for the betterment of the industry going forward. We're constantly expanding the program because that was the intention from the start. We named this program New Voices because we didn't want to restrict it to gender only, and we certainly didn't want to restrict it to the United States. We've also added 
cohorts of black executives of all gender identities in the U.S. and Latinx executives of all gender identities in the U.S. After receiving the media training for new voices, I really felt like I got more skilled in being able to provide the answers and provide the insights that I wanted to give. It gave me agency in being who I am. I think I've grown more confident as a person to express my points of view. I think it's also important for the financial services industry to be able to see me represented, to be able to see people like me represented, and to know that I do have a voice. Every week we try to do better than the week before. More female leaders given more time on air, more space on the airwaves. And this kind of work is not one and done. You know, it's very easy to slip backwards. It's very easy to lose focus. And hopefully if we stay focused, if we stay intentional, we actually will see real change. Please welcome to the stage PJT Partners Global Head of ESG Transition and Chair of Activist Defense, Allison Bennington, Cowper's Head of Investments for Private Equity, Yup Kim, and Carlisle Head of Impact, Megan Starr, with Bloomberg Shanali Basic. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having this discussion with us. We have an extraordinarily powerful set of panelists here on this. We're going to talk about ESG. We're also going to talk about the pushback that ESG has been getting lately. We're going to talk about the data that ESG requires. And importantly, we're going to talk about the financial returns that are associated or not associated in some cases with ESG. And before we get started with the, uh, with the panelists, I want to ask the audience a question. With your polling, does ESG need to be redefined? We'll be curious about what you think about this as we start to discuss what that could mean. Uh, let's start with you, Megan, because you get to see this from the private markets. And Carlisle, a year ago, announced an initiative to collect data. Now that data set includes 2,000 portfolio, 2, portfolio companies across 200, more than 200 general partners and limited partners. So why has this been such a focus for you? Sure. And thank you, Shanali. And thank you to Bloomberg. I'm a proud uh, New Voices graduate, so it's nice to stay in the family. Um, we started working on ESG data exactly because of this question around ESG backlash. One of the biggest criticisms we get is this concept of greenwashing, claiming that you've done something that you don't actually have something to back up. Greenwashing happens when everyone writes their own report card about ESG. And the antidote to that is that we have a common report card. And so we actually worked with CalPERS, Yep, and his team to say, this isn't rocket science. There are so many different frameworks for how you measure ESG data. We get more than 300 ESG data requests every year at Carlisle. Let's sit in a room and agree on how we're going to measure that so we actually get a critical mass of performance-based, quantitative data in a time series to use. So we sat in a room with Blackstone, Apollo, EQT, CBC, a whole host of our peers, and just negotiated. And so we're tracking data across our portfolio in the same way they are aggregating that into a benchmark, and we just published a report that you covered this morning, actually showing what the data has. Because we can make all the pronouncements we want as an industry about what ESG is or what it isn't. The reality is we need data to show if it works. And we're going to get to Yep in a second, who does deal with this across all those private equity firms. But Allison, you see this from a public market perspective. You're advising clients on how to navigate this constantly. So what are the biggest ESG concerns that they have? And, and I should say, you also came from the buy side. You came from Value Act before you started doing this. So you saw this firsthand as an investor yourself. Exactly. So um, it's, uh, it's been a long journey. And here we are. And as you say, there's, there's controversy around it. So um, I would say that a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I don't think that this is going away. And um, in fact, last night I was at dinner with 10 um, Fortune 100 um, board members, uh, company board members, and they are all absolutely focused on these points because the reason it isn't going away is because every, the world is changing. And we're seeing this, um, we're seeing it from a geopolitical perspective, we're seeing it from an investment perspective, a tax perspective, a regulatory perspective. And all of these companies and all of these board members absolutely recognize that their businesses are going to need to transform, but also it's a really good thing and there's a lot of opportunity around that transformation. I mean, nobody wants to profit from suffering. Um, we, I actually sit in London, we're dealing with the, you know, the war in Ukraine, and now instead of talking about um, energy transition, I mean, we're talking about energy security, we're talking about food security, 
And um, these are real issues that companies are absolutely able to address and investment into those companies ultimately is going to be a really smart thing for investors to be doing. And long-term issues. We're going to get into the public and private of it all in a second. Yep. You know, a year ago when I talked to your CEO, the CEO of CalPERS, Marcy Frost, about this Carlisle initiative, one of the things she mentioned was this is about data and data collection over a long period of time right. and proving whether it did contribute to financial returns. So what are you finding? Yeah, and look, I think at the time, uh, as, an, as a scaled asset owner, the critical pain point for us was the lack of standardized and transparent data right, across uh, kind of key ESG factors across our broader portfolio. And, and look, ESG is a complex topic, but I think we can all agree that coalescing around a very straightforward, quantifiable, comparable you know, set of metrics reported in a consistent manner is a tremendous improvement from the status quo. Just to give folks a, a little bit of an analogy, imagine if all private equity-backed portfolio companies reported different profitability metrics. Some decided to solely report on free cash flow, others EBITDA, others you know, net income. How difficult would it be to kind of truly understand the progress, the operating progress of funds over time? And, and, and kind of to the point on earlier on, on greenwashing, look, if, if a private equity manager had 10 companies, one reported a four times return, and the other nine were full write-offs, what's happening today <laughs> is that there's a glossy annual report that goes out celebrating that 4x return. It's not intellectually kind of consistent and honest around what the total progress being made is. And so I do think uh, what, what this data collection now empowers us to do is this. So when you have two GPs, general partner A and general partner B, one generated a 21% return and a 2.1 times, but while doing so, they reduced GHG you know, emissions by you know, 50%, increased renewable resources by 20%, increased corporate board diversity, added jobs, dot, dot, dot. And there's another one that generated the 2.3 times return, a 23% return, but at the same time, just kind of the really deteriorating metrics across these areas. And so you understand which strategy is riskier. <laughs> Long term, and so I, I do think uh, this is what kind of the you know EDCI uh, really empowers both asset owners and general partners to do. Now, when I looked up at the poll as it was populating, it was pretty overwhelming mm -hmm. of a yes <laughs> for the redefinition. ESG is broad. A lot of people don't even agree with a lot of the facts that are being posed on ESG theses. So, what are you thinking when you look at your clients, their needs, and uh, how they would like to tackle the problem? Yeah. It's one of my most favorite and least favorite questions. People love to say, like, I don't believe in ESG or I believe in ESG. ESG is not a religion. You don't believe in it. It's an investment methodology. And people apply it in a variety of different ways. There are excellent ESG integrated managers, and they're really poor ones. And so somehow we get stuck in this conversation of ESG is a monolith. And it's also something that you can believe in as something that is inherently going to lead to outperformance or inherently going to lead to underperformance. And like, that's just not the reality. And it's a little bit like saying, does venture capital inherently outperform or does it underperform? There are a variety of managers who have a variety of skill in, in prosecuting that. And so you know, let's take one example, climate change and the energy transition. You don't need to believe in climate change, even though it is unimpeachable science that it's happening, to think that if you're investing in a long hold infrastructure asset in coastal real estate, that you might want to be thoughtful about the insurability of that asset, the climate resilience, and how you think about its situation vis-a-vis -vis floodplains. That has nothing to do with belief. That has to do with long-term risk-adjusted returns. And so I think as an industry, we have conflated two different topics that can sometimes overlap, but they are different. And that's it. Individual investors can take individual moral, political, personal views that they want in their portfolio. You can say, I don't want to own gambling companies. You can say, I also don't want to own companies that start with the letter B. That's fine, and that's your prerogative. That's fundamentally different than taking a long-term view on what's driving risk and return in a nuanced way across assets. And, and so I think the ESG criticism is very warranted, but it's got to be correct about what are we actually criticizing. We need to focus in on how managers integrate this into their thesis, how they effectuate it, how they're tracking it, and like, does that lead to outperformance? So if you had the chance to redefine ESG, Allison, how would you give it a new name? 
Okay, um, <laughs> there's not one name because that's the problem with ESG itself. Um, I think it might be a lot better if um, managers uh, and, and products, investment products, were just clearer in how they labeled themselves. For example, very much to Megan's point, labeling yourself um, a climate risk adjusted fund. Okay, then you know what you're buying, you know, the labels on the tin. Um, an impact fund, impact in order to um, solve social or environmental problems. Um, a fund that's about energy transition. I think that, I mean, we are talking here in the invest conference, so we're talking about investment strategies. I think if um, people were a lot clearer, meaning fund managers, um, GPs were a lot clearer, I think that would really enable LPs, sophisticated or very unsophisticated, people who are buying ETFs, people who are buying mutual funds, to be very clear on what it actually it is that they're buying and what they believe in and what they don't believe in. Yep, when you're giving uh, advice, say, to managers across the industry, how do you look at it? What do you prioritize? And what are the types of investments you're more likely to make mm -mm. that are ESG friendly? Yeah, and, and again, just speaking kind of from the private equity vantage point, you know, the, the first kind of comment that I do tell our GPs is recognize the power, the privilege, and the responsibility you have as truly a change catalyst you know, to, to driving and accelerating returns while also positively impacting society. Right? You know, I, I do think, uh, just to give one analogy, I do think there was a time when uh, digital strategy was met with deep skepticism by CEOs and management teams across the board. You know, it's, it's power to accelerate revenue to you know, dramatically cut costs and also improve the productivity of workforce. And so I think we're early days on the development of <coughs> kind of the full ESG value creation toolkits, but I think there's been you know, very, you know, very meaningful kind of progress made on some of these areas. And, and so I think one of the advice I, I tell GPs is, look, you have a superior ownership model coupled with a long-term orientation. You know, use those things to, you know, Look at different types of ESG levers that can really transform your business. And, and I'm not here to tell you which ones to focus on, but this, has ex, you know, this is directly correlated to, to kind of equity value creation outcomes. And so, so there is that piece. And obviously, I also tell them to join the EDCI mm -hmm. <laughs> initiative. Because in, in many ways, I mean, it is difficult to truly understand your progress across these key ESG factors if you don't know what the rest of the industry is doing, right? You know, what is the benefit of understanding that you reduce, again, uh, GHG emissions or added, you know, an X number of jobs over a certain period if you don't know what the rest of the industry is doing? So speaking mm -hmm. of jobs, yeah. Yeah. one of the findings from the report that it, you both are involved, BCG compiles all the, all the data, and what they found <laughs> is areas that private assets, private markets have lagged are areas like board diversity, but they have gained in areas like energy. And so I'm kind of curious here, from your perspective, where does the private market surpass the public market the most and why? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll start maybe um, your question, Allison, about what should we rename this to. I think ESG done well is another lens for alpha in the 21st century. It is not the only lens, but is one if you use it well and use it to uncover insights that haven't been priced into the market yet. And I think what we saw in that data where we actually had comparable performance-based data was that what is actually happening flies in the face of the public narrative. And so one example is private equity, when maligned, is frequently characterized as an industry that comes in and strips out jobs as a way to make returns. That's not actually the reality in the 21st century, as you think about your social license to operate, as you think about economic growth. And so the data from 2,000 private companies across more than 100 GPs found that privately held companies create jobs at two to three times the rate of publicly held companies. There are definitely areas where private equity lags. Board diversity is a great example. But it also showed preliminary data that board diversity increases far faster under private equity ownership than public ownership. And I think we've talked a lot about that, but it gets this idea of concentrated ownership, longer time horizon, and the ability to really affect change such that you can exit a company to higher value. And in the 21st century, companies are worth more when they excel on material, environmental, and social dimensions. So Allison, you know, we were talking about private market ownership. There's a lot of criticism out there about, you know, ESG being difficult for a company in the public markets that is subject to short -term, shorter term returns for shareholders. Is that true from your perspective, especially, you know, from Value Act to now, right? I mean, governance was one of the early tenants of ESG. Absolutely, and I think governance, we have to really separate out from what most people think about with ESG. 
Um, to answer your question, the public markets um, are, it's hard for corporates. It's, it's very hard for corporates because there's so many different dimensions that they're dealing with. Um, and the SEC, as we all know, um, we're waiting with bated breath to see where the SEC is going to take us with the climate disclosures, which um, are a very big deal. Um, so we'll see what's going to happen there. Um, and if you're, it, it, it's a, a lot of disclosure. And we were talking, we were just talking about how important data is. Um, it's incredibly important, and there's going to be a lot of data associated with that. So um, I, I, one thing I do want to mention, though, is. Um, public companies are dealing with. It's also debt, and we're talking a lot about equity, and we're talking about private equity, but there's also private and public companies, and they their lifeblood is debt. I mean, that's how they're able to run their business. The public market investor on the equity side is obviously incredibly important and can basically hire and fire the board, so they have a big voice there, but the day-to-day -day operation of a company debt is really important. And um, we're definitely seeing much more of the debt markets turning on to this. And with interest rates rising, if companies are able to connect and genuinely connect their goals that they're trying to achieve with exactly, to Megan's point, being a 21st century um, transition company that's successful, they're going to need debt to get there. And if they can get a difference of 25 basis points or 50 basis points when interest rates are rising, that's something that really can connect the public markets into making these behavioral changes that are going to drive what will hopefully be more profitable companies going forward. Navigating some challenges here, let's take one very large, uh, very big example that, that happened this year with Disney, Disney versus Ron DeSantis. It wasn't just the governor versus the company. It was also another investor that had called out Disney, uh, one for financial performance and with certain goals, we know that a third point, but another, Strive Capital, that spoke to Disney about putting, putting political and social above the customer's needs. And so I'm wondering, how often are you seeing that among pu big publicly traded companies? Is this happening on a level that's just not playing out as much in such a public sphere? Well, this is a whole brave new world. Um, we saw it, you know, absolutely um, with Disney. We're seeing it um, with a lot of companies. A lot of the, this debate is opening up, right? I mean, there was there was just a lot of approach in, in one direction, and all of a sudden you're seeing, we'll just call it pushback um, for lack of anything else. And I think raising a question, which is really relevant, is what is the value to a company and in terms of where it is going to come out in its policies and its public statements. And this goes across to that, it goes across to the abortion debate. There's a lot of different issues here and how companies are going to be dealing with it. And it's really important more and more for companies to make sure that they're articulating and that they're clearly connecting their thesis of their business strategy to what they're doing. Um, because you leave yourself open potentially for criticism when there becomes an unclear disconnect between the business strategy and um, the policies that may come out that are not as clearly connected business strategy. So um, I think I'm kind of going around your question, but if there was anything that as a CEO or a board I would think about as they want to wade into what could be looked at as a political sphere, an area that CEOs and boards, frankly, have not had to do before, and you don't learn at Harvard Business School, and is really, really difficult, um, that sort of touchstone or North Star would be making sure that you're very clearly connecting your business strategy to what you're doing. And part of that was just to highlight also that even among a, a company's own investor base, there's disagreement on what that one company should do. That also plays out in the private markets. It's interesting. You started this with Carlisle, but you know it, I've been doing a lot of digging for, for this for this panel. And in a conversation with the rival pension scheme, you know, and this is happening for probably a lot of people here. They don't share. Not every state shares the same views on ESG, especially when it comes to the social issues. Yep. So for, when you're a, when you're a GP, how do you deal with navigating across state lines and frankly international lines at yep. that rate? Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, we don't need to call it ESG. And I think that actually would help a lot. And so you know, people, again, think of it as very much of a binary. You're a green company or you're a brown company. You care about social issues. You don't care about social issues. And I think the, the reality is, where are these factors associated with long-term performance? You might think that diversity is just a social issue, and companies shouldn't comment on it, and that you know it's not something for business performance. It's not connected. We have 300 portfolio companies-ish on any given day at Carlisle. 
The data in our portfolio is unimpeachable. Our companies that have more diverse boards have higher earnings growth by a significant margin. Correlation, causation, the data is there. And so if you can connect those factors to why more diverse teams make better decisions, lead teams in a different route, that fundamentally has to be where the conversation begins and ends because we all have different views about social issues, about the way we want the world to be. But I think we need to get out of this idea of good versus bad, green versus brown, et cetera. And the energy transition is a great example. You mentioned this, Allison, of you know, in the lead up to COVID and in the lead up to all the chaos we've seen in energy markets this past year, huge focus on climate change. Some people interpreted that as renewable energy or bust. And what we're seeing is the answer is we need all of the above. And frankly, the highest decarbonization potential is in the most carbon intensive businesses. So a bit of a toss up question for the team here, because each of you have focused in on financial performance, but a common complaint that you hear from investors and companies is that they feel like the whims of lawmakers and all of the forces of social change. So when does it start to matter for financial performance? When can it be unignorable, given that, at the end of the day, lawmakers are constituent? Well, <laughs> you hear different things from different lawmakers, and it makes it incredibly difficult. Um, and we're seeing that more and more now. And it's um, often pulling into social issues. Um, again, I, I kind of, I, I got to go back to sort of more this global perspective um, that you are seeing different currents um, in Europe and then you are seeing in the US. In Europe, those, those sort of like the government and the political elements of it tend to be tied directly to a lot of these same policies. So it, it is a little bit different, and which is why I did bring up the war, because it really focused, um, it focused a lot of people on this, these issues of security. But um, it's incredibly difficult to now, you can't please everybody all of the time, and we all know that, um, which is, makes it really, really hard. So I would, again, go back to that touchstone, is the business strategy. And um, if your business strategy is very tightly understood and very tightly um, articulated and the company is all striving in that direction, I, my opinion is it may be better to ignore the noise and just kind of stick with the path. <laughs> I also think we kept waiting for action on a price on carbon because that would then dictate corporate behavior. We, we haven't gotten that in a global way. But what we're seeing is actually corporate pressures are pushing our portfolio companies way faster. We call it the net zero domino effect. 90% of the world's GDP is now covered by net zero commitments. And what that means is large corporates like Walmart, Target, et cetera, as they make these commitments to reduce their carbon emissions, they push that up and down their supply chain. So if you're thinking about selling in to a municipal customer, to a corporate customer, all, all of these different constituents, you might be miles away from the energy supply chain, but if you don't know your carbon emissions now and you're not slightly better than peers, you don't win that piece of business. So I think we focused on the kind of regulatory legal side for a long time, but I think the competitive pressures are here today and that's actually changing business decisions. Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, the only thing I would add is like as, as industries transition towards more sustainable and inclusive business models, you know, it, it is, you know, again, private equity's job to just figure out, you know, how do you uh, not, you know, see where the puck is going, right? You know, and, and how, how do you future proof your businesses such that if there are, you know, regulatory action and change that you don't, you know, get caught empty handed, mm -hmm. where, whereas all your competitors are, are just very well prepared for, for some of those, you know, transitions. And, and I do think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the data that, that is being collected through EBCI is early, but I think, uh, you know, overall, if, if you see uh, kind of private equity owners catalyze change where you're, you know, kind of increasing employee engagement, reducing work, workplace injuries, you know, adding jobs, I, I do think there's just a lot of positive tailwinds, you know, to, to the outcomes of these deals. And so I, I think, uh, you know, just in terms of correlation and causation, we're still early and being able to uh, really solidly make those you know statements, but again, I think you know in the same way, digital strategy, softwares, you know, application software, you know, kind of services and infrastructures, transformative power to really propel and accelerate our <laughs> global industry. You know, I, I think I think we're early days, but I, I am hopeful that as we amass more data, that will become much more clear and less of a guess. Right? 
early I think days. You may have just hit on something, um, calling it sustainable future-proofed investing <laughs> <laughs> instead of ESG. <laughs> yeah, well, that was going to be my final final words here from each of you because you know if you, if this is a nascent industry and it's you know reaching its adolescent phase, is, if that's fair enough, uh, what is kind of the the most interesting and next vantage point that you are pushing towards? I, I like the concept of dynamic materiality. As we get to know these topics and they get better understood, they get priced in. But there always is something coming around the corner. We saw that with the Me Too movement a few years ago. That wasn't historically a deep part of diligence for new companies. That has become a standard part of how we think about management teams and culture. I think we're seeing that with climate right now as we understand what to price in, how to value that. But there are issues coming down the pike at us from water scarcity to biodiversity, et cetera, and they're really going to impact company performance. So I love that idea of this is constantly evolving. And as we understand things, you know, we can manage them, but there's always something new coming. How do you move the needle forward? Like, I think the search for alpha is incredibly competitive, and it's hard. And so you need to win on every angle, right? Yeah. Just think about <clears throat> just kind of, uh, you know, Many of you guys are leaders of large organizations, and so in terms of even attracting kind of the next generation of top decile talent, you know, like just having the proper culture, the right mission, the toolkits to really attract and retain these individuals is critical to winning the next decade. And how do you do that without, you know, kind of having these things in mind, you know, as as you kind of propel your your companies forward? And so. I love that idea of dynamic materiality, Megan. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. And I'm so glad that you brought up other issues besides climate and also the biodiversity um, and these other issues. And it's so important. And therefore, um, companies that are um, going to be um, sustainable and future-proofed and very, very profitable in all of that is going to be um, the future. Thank you all so much for taking my questions. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>
Um, so at the after sale service, we have uh, we give ten years warranty, and we either meet or beat the uh, after sales uh, standards in the market. So that that is the intention. I think in in the U.S. in particular, we have uh, very flexible um, sales models. So we have this uh, innovative battery leasing model where um, consumer can can lease the battery, and as a result of that, we can reduce the uh, upfront pricing um, and uh, make it more accessible to to the consumer. Uh, for the consumer that want to buy the battery, we also sell the battery together with the vehicle as well. Um, and I think. Uh, uh, one factor that helps is um, the U.S. as well as a lot of uh, states are very open and have, have different policies to um, reduce um, internal combustion engine vehicles and to promote um, electric vehicles like building infrastructure, charging infrastructure, for example. So all those factors together just um, make us confident that we should be able to break in. I think that's a, it's a really interesting model, what you're working on with having people the opportunity to buy the battery or to lease the battery. I think one of the things we talk about with Bloomberg Green very frequently is, is people are going to have to rethink the way that they're buying cars and that, that the transition to electric vehicles requires us to, to rethink some of these traditional models. And, and you guys are doing exactly that with, with this new strategy. Um, I'm, I'm sure most people here, or many people in the US, don't know you, don't know the, the brand. I know you're still quite new, have only been around for a couple of years. Um, so how are you introducing the, the VinFast brand to the US? How are you welcoming yourselves and introducing yourselves to this new market? Um, we, um, um, we, we chose from the beginning the, con, um, the direct-to-consumer model. So we always go um, direct to the consumer and tell our story directly to the, to the consumer. Uh, in the U.S., um, in particular, we started in um, uh, November last year uh, with, um, for the first time, a global debut of uh, Binfast EV at uh, Los Angeles Auto Show. Um, so we showed the VF8 and VF9 as the concept uh, vehicles. And then uh, January this year uh, at the CES in Las Vegas, we, um, for the first time, we unveiled the whole portfolio of EVs from a segment, which is a VF5 and VF6, VF7, VF8, and VF9. So basically covering all the SUV, covering all the segments um, of, of the market. Um, and then we also unveil our EV strategy. Uh, we also uh, told the world that we are stopping uh, manufacturing, um, manufacturing internal combustion engine vehicles this year, and we become 100% <coughs> EV company uh, this year. Um, and then in uh, April, also here in New York City, we participated in the New York Auto Show and we let people test drive our cars for the first time. Uh, we got a lot of attention uh, at New York Auto Show. Uh, a lot of questions, like I said, you know, who are you? And, uh, but uh, the line in front of our um, test drive is always the longest one at New York Auto Show. So that gave us a lot of um, encouragement. Um, and then we, um, uh, you know, seeing is believing. So we brought a lot of over the years. We organized. We have organized uh, four tours to Vietnam already. Uh, we brought people from the U.S., from Europe, from all over the world to to see us in Vietnam, uh, to see uh, Vinfast, to see VinGroup e ecosystem, um, to see what we do, and to test drive our cars. So we 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 have brought over more than a thousand people on on those trips uh, to Vietnam, and the words got out. You know, people from all different walks of life, you know, the KOL, the um, media, and that has been um, very helpful to, to get the words out and to tell our story as well. And you will start seeing, as we approaching um, delivering cars in the US uh, by the end of the year, you can start seeing us um, getting um, to the consumer and telling more of our story. So much of, of the US auto market is built around trust. Either you're trusting in these brands that are deeply American and entrenched in America, or you're trusting in these foreign cars that you feel like are going to perform incredibly well. How are you, um, as you guys are introducing yourself to the US market, how are you building that level of trust for the brand? Um, first of all, I mean, one of the reasons why we give a 10 years warranty or 125,000 miles warranty, which is above the market, is to um, tell people that we, we believe in our products and we're willing to stand behind our products. Uh, Vin, uh, VinFast is part of VinGroup, and VinGroup in Vietnam is the largest uh, uh, private conglomerate in Vietnam. We have um, a track record of building multiple 
um, successful market leading businesses in all different sectors in Vietnam. So in Vietnam, we, we have an ecosystem that um, basically cover all parts of life of, uh, of a consumer. Um, and uh, we, have <coughs> we have shown our commitment to the, um, to the US market you know, by the, um, making billions of dollars investment in the factory in North Carolina. Um, providing uh, thousands of jobs to to the Americans and uh, committing ourselves to to the market. So, um, so I hope that gradually the consumer will see that we are really committed and um, we're willing to stand behind our product. Fantastic! Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. We are going to um, thank you thank you all again. We're at the all important moment, which is lunchtime, which I'm sure everybody's excited for. Um, so thank you so much again for, for joining the conversations this morning. We are going to make our way out of this room. So you're going to go out these doors here. We're going to go across the pantry area. Um, our team is going to lead you up to an elevator bank to the 29th floor. And then you're going to go down to the 28th floor. I promise it sounds complicated, but it's not. We're going to lead you the entire way that you get there. Our team is going to be holding your hands. Um, if you have registered for the Investo, Invesco QQQ Outlook for Growth lunch session, you're also going to go to the 29th floor. Our team is going to meet you there and direct you to the lunch. So everyone's going to 29. If you're turning into the, into the lunch session virtually, uh, please just scroll down to the next section on the agenda. You're going to click that um, on the agenda tab. Join the broadcast at noon. We'll see you all back at, at 1 o'clock. Um, we have great conversations with Boaz Weinstein, a crypto block with Dan Moorhead, and the actress from HBO's industry. Thank you all so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.